question of okay. may I start? Yes, Sana. Go ahead. Okay. So um, yeah, good evening um, to all of you. Welcome to this um, webinar day two uh, of our symposium on reimagining cities post-COVID. Um, this is um, a long journey. We have been together, a large group of co-organizers. Uh, you can see the logos. I will not mention all the names um, and uh, even the large range of organizations, I'm afraid. Uh, this early in the morning for me here in Brazil, I might forget someone, but uh, it has been a long journey of yeah, almost two years already, uh, where we have been meeting on a weekly basis um, and reflecting about issues that are affecting our cities uh, in India and overall in the global south. Uh, last year, we focused on, on rental housing because it was a strategic uh, for the policy response in India considering uh, the migration flows uh, after COVID. Uh, but we also discuss a lot the relevance of informality um, in this scenario, uh, which is actually uh, common ground uh, to our cities uh, through the global south. Urban informality, informality of land, informality of labor, uh, in, of citizenship, uh, multi-dimension uh, of urban informality, which is actually uh, something we need to deal on a serious basis um, in this post-COVID era. Um, so um, we started, yes, uh, actually on Monday with the first day of our symposium, it's a three-day one. Uh, we looked at um, how cities are planning um, to really address um, informality of land, urban informality. We listened to the experiences from Sao Paulo, the social special zoning, all the instruments to capture land value and redistribute uh, towards the city. Uh, we heard um, about the experience from Nairobi, the special planning area, also a very strategic uh, and very innovative uh, planning instrument uh, to enable uh, access to infrastructure, flexibility of, of, of planning standards, of construction standards, um, and a an holistic, comprehensive development approach um, in the areas, uh, in the slum areas uh, from Kenya uh, that are earmarked as a special planning area. We heard about the special case of Mukuru, which is one of the pilot ones. Uh, we also heard about uh, the rehabilitation uh, scheme in Mumbai, which is actually a, a, an old scheme and also very well discussed um, throughout um, our countries in the global south, throughout development agencies. Um, then we had a lively debate uh, with a couple of institutions and experts, you know, on the challenges that we face in India um, to tackle this, um, these issues. So um, today um, we are gonna look to um, experiences uh, from India, from Orisha and from Punjab, but also um, uh, Indonesia, uh, which has a national um, scheme uh, supporting Islam upgrading. Uh, we will also hear from South Africa, from Durban actually, which has a national, but also a local strategy uh, to deal with informal settlements. And then we will debate around um, the challenges and how we envision uh, the future of um, you know, Islam upgrading um, in our cities. In, in, in this process of reimagining uh, the cities after COVID. Um, so, yeah, so I think this is enough for us to start. I think we should jump directly into the presentations. Uh, we start with Mati, uh, Mati uh, from Odisha. Uh, I understand Mati is the principal secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, from the government of Odisha. And I understand they have been also very innovative, very progressive in terms of uh, developing uh, comprehensive approaches towards uh, informal settlements, vulnerable territories in the state. Um, through um, the JAGA mission, uh, more recently providing universal access to basic services uh, to <laughs> the citizens of the state. So uh, Mati, uh, I hand over to you uh, for you to start your presentation. Thank you so much, Anna. Good afternoon to all. 
i will be sharing uh, the experiences of odisha working with slum empowerment slum upgradation let me is the screen visible yes it's visible okay. thank you <clears throat> Only Matty, yeah, now it's on, on presentation mode. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So uh, we are implementing the mission called Jaga Mission. It is a slum empowerment program, empowering the slum dwellers, participatory mode. Giving a, a brief context about the state, the uh, Odisha lies in the eastern uh, part of the India. We have 7 million people living in the urban areas, out of which 1.8 million lives in the slums. One fourth of the state's population lives in slums. There are 2,919 slums, 412,000 households with 1.8 million population. About the slum, generally we have the, <clears throat> normally we get the question of what do we do with the slum? The city, slum is an urban character and it's a, a, a kind of you know uh, yeah, where people live in in human conditions without adequate infrastructure and amenity services so the normal question is should we evict them or recognizing their contribution in making the city in the city's growth functioning to empower them our honorable chief minister shri navin patnaik he decided to empower them by providing the land rights recognizing the slum. This is, the, this is from the statesman. He convened the cabinet meeting only with this agenda of empowering the slum dwellers with the land rights. So he said in the meeting that it is because of their sacrifice and hard work, our kitchens run, the gardens bloom, the city breathes and we feel secure. So he said that we take this historic landmark decision which sets a benchmark for the entire country. So this sets the tone for all our actions subsequently in implementing the Jaga mission. This is the uh, features of the Land Rights Act. In the uh, municipalities, they get a maximum of 45 square meter, uh, free of cost, and the land is heritable, mortgageable for housing, but not saleable. It can be used only for residential or residential come livelihood purpose. It cannot be used for pure commercial purpose. That's only to prevent that they sell off their land again, go back to the slum. And the, for urban poor, it is provided free of cost. For other than poor, non-poor families, it is 50% of a notional value of the land. And with this, we also launched the mission called Jaga Mission. It's Odisha Livable Habitat Mission. The purpose is to convert the slums into livable habitats with all necessary infrastructure, amenities, and services. It was launched on 7th May 2018 by Honorable CM. The progress in implementing the phase one of the Jaga Mission, that is the land rights program, is so far we uh, provided land rights to more than 70,000 families in situ, wherever they are living. And for more than 1,3,000 families, we have granted land rights, land entitlement certificates, recognizing the slum and their existence there. And 2,919 slum dwellers associations have been formed and are in active. And for the phase one, since we are implementing the world's largest slum titling and slum upgradation program, we have received international as well as international recognitions with World Habitat Award of 2019. Move, we moved on to phase two. Uh, the objective of the Jaga mission itself is to the, transform the slums into livable habitat. So we call that as a Biju Adarsh Colony program. It was launched on 28th September 2020 last year in the midst of COVID. And uh, we also issued the standard operating procedure to be followed in the upgradation process. The program has been taken up in all slums across 114 cities. And uh, we have set a target of transforming the slums to livable habitat by March 2022. And we had an interim target. We took about 28 cities on pilot basis with about 500 slums to be upgraded 
and converted to habit livable habitats by 1st April 2021. So what, what the components which we take up in the slum upgradation is that the first process of the empowerment or transformation is granting the land rights in situ basis, followed by providing housing support, financial assistance for them to build their house, individual household water supply connection, tap water connection to every household, access to individual household toilet, constructing toilet for every home, then yeah, electricity house connection, then paved road streets, stormwater drainage, street lighting, and common facilities like Paricheo, that is our signet, uh, you know, sig signature uh, uh, building. It's called the, uh, it's a multi-purpose community center. We call it as a Paricheo means uh, the, uh, the, the, the face of the slum. That's a, uh, the, it is expected to act as a hub of the slum and open space development and the child play area. So this is the Jaga Mission logo. The center is the Jaga Mission logo. Jaga is written in Odia, the local language. There are about nine rays in the uh, logo you will find. Each ray depicts a particular transformative process or intervention to be taken up. And the, uh, we have uh, uh, come out with a standard operating procedure to ensure uniformity and standardization of the process to be followed. Since it's a pan-state program involving 114 cities and 2,900 slum dwellers associations are involved, thousands of functionaries are involved in the process. We have standardized that. The step-by-step -step process has been done. First, to identify the slum, take a participatory need assessment of the basic infrastructure facilities and the services in consultation with the slum dwellers, slum dwellers association, prepare the infrastructure gap, then prepare the action plan with the upgradation projects, how to finance, how do we execute, then take up the execution process, put in the money, complete, uh, complete the upgradation projects. Then once the infrastructures and amenities services are provided, then that slum is no more a slum. It meets the requirement of a neighborhood habitat. So the Slum Dwellers Association take up that slum for delisting to change the name and to remove from the list of the slum. That is called a delisting proposal. It is done by the Slum Dwellers Association itself. Then a district, the, the city level committee headed by the district magistrate or the collector. It's a multi-member committee. That committee examines the proposals, verifies the infrastructure upgradation process and approve the delisting. Then the, 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 the Slum Dweller Association is uh, the change to a resident welfare association like, like a uh, neighborhood community. The infrastructure projects in the slums are implemented by the uh, Slum Dwellers Association themselves, by the, by the community. No contractors are engaged in the process. And they are also paid 7.5% 7 of the project cost as supervision charges. The, the roles and responsibility of the Slum Dweller Association is to act as a bridge between the community and the urban local, the city and the, and, and the government, state government. We build the capacity of the communities, enhance their skills. They actively participate in the upgradation process, in the infrastructure need assessment, gap analysis, and, and leading the entire, participate in the entire process leading to delisting of the slums. They are also become the implementing partners, monitoring the infrastructure upgradation, upgradation works. And they also, after creation of these infrastructures, amenities, they also supposed to manage the community assets. So the, the progress, we started, uh, we started this phase in uh, September 2020. See, the progress so far is in the pilot phase, we took up 500 slums, we end up doing 550 slums. We targeted to complete 1st April 2021 by, we took one more month due to COVID. By 30th of April, we could complete uh, a transformation of 550 slums from to livable habitat. We call it as a others colony. In 2018 ULBs, benefiting about more than 81,000 families, covering 3.367,000 uh, uh, population. And the details of the infrastructure upgradation taken up in those 550 slums or even there. And the, the process has been done with complete involvement of the slum communities and the Slum Dwellers Association. 
about about 500 5500 slum association leaders spearheaded this infrastructure upgradation which was in 200 projects so these are some of the photographs of the upgradation process taken up in some of the urban local bodies before and after the paved road the community centers the open space development the recreation facilities created the paved uh, streets this is this is the our signature facility community the multi purpose community center parichaya they use this for holding their meetings regular meetings for doing their celebrations events social events family events and it's also used for taking classes for the young children tuitions open gym play equipments so that what you have seen is the in situ development of the existing slum there are few slums which are located in lands which are objectionable where in situ land rights cannot be settled those are the railway lands the slums which have come up on closer to the track railway track or the slums which have come up on the water bodies flood plain so near near the river bank so those are or closer to the garbage dumping yard those are the slums where the land rights cannot be settled and should not be settled so those kind of objectionable locations those slums we uh, take up consultation with the communities and in consultation and in in, in participation with the communities we, uh, we we make them to relocate their slum it's a relocation process with the full consent of the communities <clears throat> only on two uh, uh, grounds it should be environmentally hazardous or it should be a sensitive location right railway or defense land and the 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 new habitats where they are relocated which are selected based on consultation process a number of sites are offered to them the urban local body and the slum dwellers jointly uh, select the location once they select the location then a layout is prepared and infrastructure and amenities and uh, uh, services are provided created we create actually a plotted mini layout for housing the slum the facilities that are to be provided whatever is being provided in the in situ similar facilities are created in this greenfield site like the tap water supply individual household toilet electricity house connection street light paved street storm water drainage children's play area open space parichaya along with the individual land right with housing support so also all are provided and then they here they also have their you know advantage of choosing their neighbors they select the plots and they construct their own house the sop is issued for this purpose and the principles that are to be followed to move a slum is that all other options are to be exhausted for in situ settlement and the, the slum all households have to en block relocate it is not part relocation not 50% move 50% stay here only when more than 80% give consent then the slum is taken up for relocation and participation of every slum dweller at every step is ensured so we have identified about 120 slums from 27 cities in 15 districts which are located on the objectionable land where in situ land rights cannot be granted and these uh, 10 are in the advanced stages of development and the remaining would be taken up in uh, in few and you can see one of these sites here casing here this is on, on the left hand side you will find the gopalpur this is the gopalpur site take the where the new habitat would be developed the officials slum dwellers they go to the site and see it and this is the jaga mission display board you will find where the layout is printed and displayed everybody can see what would be the layout of the new habitat and the new habitat is under development all the plots plots are made by in consultation with them and the individual plots are chosen by the individual slum dwellers and this is a slum in kalahandi district kesinga city where the slum has been demolished by the railway authorities for expansion of the railway lines 
we have taken up uh, we have moved them to an alternative location transit location and we are creating this uh, new habitat and this is the new habitat under creation these are the housing support that are provided to them they are constructing concrete houses along with the parichay of common the, the the open space development all are under construction every house would have a pipe water supply connection electricity connection individual household toilet with land right so, so these are the activities and the, the new habitat the develop the, the 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 slum upgradation program is in full swing we have a uh, a target of completing 9900 slums by december 2021 and reaching 2264 slums by march 2022 in addition to the already upgraded slums of 550 by april 21 these are our partners we owe our success to our partners who have been supporting this program right from beginning tata trust omedia network kada star transfer and in phase 2 cpr is our uh, valuable partner along with janagraha and this is the <clears throat> story uh, up, to, up to date of jaga mission thank you so much thank you uh mati this was very very clear so you have a clear um, plan strategy a timeline pipeline uh there was a, a comment here from chat maybe during the panel you can uh detail a little bit more about the criteria high uh, prioritization criteria but it was a very comprehensive presentation yeah i think we have less than more cases of uh city wide uh, strategies on islam upgrading a state wide uh, experience so i think this is very valuable for for many cities in the global south so we move to another state in india we move to punjab uh we'll have Ajoy Sharma he is the CEO of Punjab Municipal Infrastructure Development Company uh, he will share about the Islam Development Program Bazera which is part of uh, Islam Free Punjab uh, strategy I'm, i apologize i'm not uh, being detailed about the bios but we are sharing uh, the detailed bios uh, over chat so yeah please go ahead ajoy thank you ana and thank you matisa for wonderful presentation as i was interacting with all of you before the session that uh, we have been learning from odisha and uh, we are taking our baby steps and uh, my presentation would brief uh, you about the baby steps taken by us and, uh, uh, and thank you so much for the session it's a great learning opportunity for us so i will be sharing my screen and i will be giving a brief presentation so so can you see the presentation is it there not yet ajoy okay just a moment aman ek minute aayenge yeah i see it i think now it's coming yeah it's there is visible now it's visible yeah. it's on presentation mode so please yeah. go ahead yeah so uh we are uh, before i start i would thank uh, government of odisha and especially mati sir and uh, cpr for uh, uh, their guidance and implementing our kind of uh, uh, for notification of a or x rules and our schemes so uh, punjab has tried to emulate uh, odisha though definitely uh, the conditions in odisha and punjab are little different so we have um, improvised on the program done by mati sir in odisha so uh, punjab is uh, situated in the northwestern uh, part of the country and shares boundary with neighbor uh, uh, pakistan so uh, overview of presentation i would like to tell about the background and the approaches we have taken so uh, this slide gives us the statistics as per census 2011 and as per 2011 we had approximately 3 lakh households living in slums and uh, uh, the slums are either on state government land private land central government land and maybe different boards and corporations land so uh, approximately 
60,000 households uh, live on our state government land. So initially, we have taken up the slum dwellers on the state government land as, uh, as a pilot because uh, it would be easier for us to get the land. It is little uh, difficult or uh, to get the land from the central government in this or other. So in the, it can be said as phase one. And in phase one, we have taken state government, the slums taken in, uh, uh, slums situated in state government land. So uh, as it is quite obvious also, uh, we have two million plus cities, Amritsar and Lujana, and 40% of our slum dwellers lives in, live in these uh, two cities. And uh, mostly the bigger towns and bigger cities have uh, uh, higher concentration of these slums. So uh, based on uh, uh, our studies uh, of different parts of the country and especially Odisha and uh, as well, we came out with uh, Punjab Slum Dwellers Property Rights Act because it was very important that uh, slum dwellers should be empowered. Till now, they are not able to take any loans and they don't have a actually kind of existence. They don't have the address. And this is a very, very big thing. So uh, we notified the uh, this act, uh, Punjab Slum Dwellers Act in 2020. And to kind of uh, uh, operationalize it, we went for the rule and the uh, guidelines, which is a kind of Basira scheme. We gave name, uh, Basira is the name given to this scheme, which is based on these uh, this framework of this act and the rules. So uh, the basic purpose was to kind of empower the slum dwellers with the property rights and then to provide basic civil civic amenities and decent shelter to uh, the slum dwellers and it was uh, the act was quite liberal any slum uh, we define slum as a agglomeration of 25 households or more who are living in a uh, bad situation deliberated houses and not um, very good uh, uh, conditions. And uh, whether it was notified, unnotified, or the committee, which involved the community members and the local members, would take a decision whether it's a particular pocket or agglomeration is slum or not. So we kept it very liberal. And the purpose was, again, to give the uh, property rights as well as the civic communities to them. And uh, finally, as uh, Odisha has done, the, after providing basic civic amenities, these will be delisted. Uh, as in many cases, the slum households living on those in those slums need assistance in terms of uh, definitely their housing needs because these uh, houses are not uh, kind of, they are kacha houses in many of the cases and uh, not livable ones. So, uh, we have kind of converged with our wonderful scheme, PMAY, Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, so that it's a kind of a uh, cohesion between the two. And uh, the most important thing is empowering the community and involving them in all the decision making, whether it is the survey or any other stuff is there. The community members and the local slum dwellers, they are part of any decision making there at the local level. Uh, it covers all, all our corporations and uh, committees and uh, notified area committees and ev every city. So in our case, the pilot was throughout the state on the state government land. It is a little different from uh, Odisha's thing. Odisha selected some of the ULBs and piloted that in some of the ULBs. We went in a different fashion. We went for all the ULBs in one go but state government land where hassle is a little less and we need to concentrate on other things uh, involving uh, people there and that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, we created SOPs, guidelines, FAQs, so that uh, whether we are going for any survey or whether we are going for kind of uh, inviting objections or 
everything. It was standard SOPs, but developed definitely without training the people at the ground level. It is very, very, uh, uh, it is impossible to kind of uh, deliver such kind of schemes. So we are thankful to CPR with an association with them. We came out with our FAQs. We came out with this uh, training of the master trainers who actually uh, trained uh, uh, our staff in our ULBs. And I would like to tell that uh, uh, that act came uh, in uh, say October uh, 2020, and uh, anybody living on slums uh, uh, before that, oh, sorry, April 2020, anyone living in the slums before 1st April 2020 was eligible for it. So uh, here we define that uh, there are three types of urban local bodies, municipal corporations, municipal councils, and notified area committee, depending on the population. This is the um, bifurcation. So in case of municipal corporation, we said that uh, up to 30 square meter of the space will be given free of cost. In case of councils, it was 45 and notified area committees, which are smaller ones, is 60 square meter of the space given free of cost. In fact, literally free of cost, but if the, you are very high income, then a very nominal charge of 12.5% of the collector rate. Collector rate is very basic rate kind of stuff. That was charged from them. And all uh, and if somebody is occupying more area, and uh, uh, then that additional land is given to them or additional the property right, right for additional land is granted after uh, payment of uh, um, collector rates, which is again very nominal. And all these funds would go to that municipal uh, development fund itself, which would be used for development of that uh, slum there. So uh, it was like ULB are, ULB are not using as a source of income, but something which will be kind of plowed, which will be kind of used there itself. EWS categories don't have to pay anything. EWS, again, we kept it uh, very liberal, uh, around 3 lakh, 300,000 uh, rupees annual income. They were considered, they are considered as EWS in our case. And uh, one more thing we did was, uh, generally to get the certificate of income, it's a cumbersome process. We said, we done away with that. We said self-certification is good enough. If somebody says that my income is below 300,000, we said it's okay, we trust you. And uh, um, it has been, uh, uh, we found that, in fact, uh, we got it randomly checked and we found that the self certification is decently done. People are uh, quite honest in kind of declaring their income. Uh, now here uh, to kind of uh, uh, implement the scheme, we had uh, mostly the, uh, the structure was like, there was an empowered committee chaired by chief minister. Chief minister or uh, chief minister took a great uh, kind of initiative in this. And uh, to, because as I said, that we have taken state government land and land of boards and corporations in case some department has some issues, then empowered committee was there to kind of sort out those issues. And state steering committee, uh, was led by the is led by the chief secretary and other uh, secretaries uh, whose lands are involved in it and PMIDC uh, I'm CEO of PMIDC we were kind of chosen as uh, uh, the nodal agencies for that so within a span of seven to eight months we have been able to uh, do a decent job where we have been able to survey all the slums uh, in all 167 urban local bodies of the state. And uh, we developed mobile application for that. There are photographs and all. Again, learning from the learning from Orissa that uh, uh, we had got some kind of form which we improvise as per our needs and then uh, photographs, drone images, and uh, uh, all that kind of stuff was in all 167 ULBs uh, we have done in six to seven months. So very simple kind of uh, 
this gives a very simple flow uh, of, of the process. So once the uh, local committee identifies the slum areas, uh, we lay it down on the revenue boundary and then again ascertain the ownership of the land, whether it's state government land or some corporations land or that kind of stuff. And then one important thing uh, we do is tenability um, analysis. So we look at the master plan, we look at from the environment point of view, we look at it from different point of views to see whether uh, the slum is tenable or not. So our focus is more on in situ development. So in cases where uh, it is not possible or the slums are not tenable, then uh, uh, we think of kind of rehabilitating them. But uh, this analysis which we do here is quite rigorous uh, because there is no point on simply giving proprietary rights and uh, kind of at the end of the day, uh, keeping them in uh, no livable conditions. So after looking at the master plans and other environment stuff and other stuff, uh, we kind of determine the tenable slum, uh, the tenability of the slum, and then we can we have conducted these drone surveys. So PMIDC team, so our uh, manager urban planning uh, takes care of it. We have kind of uh, uh, created an in-house capacity here. They the teams go there, do drone surveys, process the images, and kind of put it on revenue record. And again, the household surveys are done on the mobile app and uh, uh, the eligibility and everything is uh, kind of uh, ascertained through mobile app itself. So the data uh, is coming by quite regularly and it is checked by the teams at the local level and the, uh, it's a sample check done by your state team also. So in case uh, uh, the slum is tenable, in that case, PRC, is issued, and in case if it is slum is non tenable then eligibility certificates are given to them that uh, we will develop this colony somewhere else, and then they will be shifted. So this is general. Uh, so as I told earlier, that uh, uh, in our case, Batinda, Amritsar, and Ludhiana is the highest uh, population of slums. So this is kind of drone imagery which we take, we just demarcate the boundary and then um, kind of lay the uh, revenue record on then these 1515 is your customer number or revenue numbers. And then uh, we kind of superimpose the roots and all, everything, every feature is kind of digitized. So a lot of transparency is there and uh, everyone knows what kind of parcel and it is laid on the master plan also. So uh, under Amrut uh, scheme, we have done all our master plan GIS based so that mapping is there, all are numbered. So a uh, lot of focus is there on transparency and it's like the areas have been mapped and people, in any case, if there are 100 households, so tomorrow there will not be 110 because everything is noted here. And uh, uh, with these numbers, every detail is attached here. So uh, as I told you that in case of uh, um, tenable lands, we'll look at the master plans and other uh, and typology and then decide whether if it is tenable, then after survey, PRC is assumed. And in case of uh, non-tenable, we, uh, in fact, take their consent for relocation. So all socioeconomic details and plot area and everything is uh, collected there. Again, one more thing uh, to simplify the processes, all the declarations to be given, uh, it's a, based on self-certification and standard format. So this is a uh, new rose colony. Uh, Every detail is captured here. A lot of effort goes at, uh, here in digitizing and kind of doing this. And uh, I am uh, uh, really grateful to my team that within a very short span of time, they were able to kind of uh, uh, do this technical stuff here. 
So these are some of the photographs which we have got from uh, our mobile apps. Uh, all the declarations and the uh, photo ID proof and the name and the, uh, the photograph of the uh, house in which they are living. So uh, till now we have been able to do uh, 62 slum on state government land and uh, we have been able to uh, do uh, identify 15, almost 15,000 potential households and we have approved around 7,000 households in 45 slums, uh, which are tenable and uh, uh, we are giving it, uh, uh, um, those have been distributed and next around 5,000 households are uh, going to be cleared in the next sharing meeting of October. So almost 11,000 uh, households will be given uh, PR rights by um, first week of October. So uh, this is it from my side. Thank you so much. Yes, we have taken baby steps with learning and uh, uh, would appreciate the comments, especially from Matisa, uh, to improve it. Thank you. Thank you, Ajoy. I don't see baby steps there, but it's fine. <laughs> I, I, I actually realized that I think I never uh, introduced myself. So uh, I'm Ana Claudia Rosba to the public, uh, regional manager for the Cities Alliance in here in Latin America. Uh, so we have lots of questions. So we have a, a very short Q&A slot here before we go to the international presentations. I see uh, Three Devi is already there and Faisal, but we have so many questions. So I, I was trying to compile in the questions and um, we have, I believe one, I try to organize one specific question and one more generic question for both. So maybe uh, Matt, you can come first. There are some questions about prioritization, uh, the percentage of, of, of relocation and what you do with you know, people living in rental. Maybe you can detail a little bit more these aspects. Yeah, the criteria for re the slum upgradation is nothing. It has to be a slum, that's all. All slums on universal coverage basis are taken up for slum upgradation. So there are no separate criteria for that. They have to be a slum, that's all. The percentage of slums taken up for uh, uh, relocation and new habitat is, is very less actually. I would see out of 2,900, say about out of 3,000 slums, uh, it's only 120 slums are so far identified at the state level. That that comes to how many? How many? About five, six percent. That's all. And the question was actually on numbers. Four, four I actually it's changed only four percent of the slums. <laughs> yeah, it's only four percent. Ninety-six yeah. percent are uh, 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 settled with land rights in situ and upgraded in situ. Uh -huh. And what's the second one? At the rental. So people who, who live yeah, in rental. Those, yeah, see, see, the slums are mostly in the government land. So if somebody has constructed a house, so the constructing a house on government land itself is an encroachment. So how is that an encroachment, encroacher, renting it out and charging from a, 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 no, a tenant? So that itself is ironical. So that we have simply ignored it. We said that whoever is in occupation of the house will be settled with the land rights. We don't recognize who built it. Whoever is living in that would be settled. That is how we, de we dealt with that rental one. And those who are in actual occupation have got land rights. Okay, thank you, Martin. Maybe we can also hear from, from, from the international speakers how they deal with, with the rental options. This is, uh, I think, a very strategic aspect, yeah. Uh, Ajoy, uh, for you, so what's the criteria for untenable um, slums? How you deal more in detail? You explained already, uh, but maybe uh, you can detail a little bit more about, you know, uh, how property rights are granted um, in, your, in your scheme. And I have a question because I, I was very curious. Uh, you have a very, you know, high level technological approach and you know, synergies with the master plan. I just wanted to know, uh, you know the role participation and communities have um, in, the, in the process of designing and implementing the program, yeah. 
So, uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, so, first of all, uh, uh, in fact, I would also go back to the same thing that in case of rental, the, as Mati sir said, even in Punjab, we are because going for state government land. So, there is no question of rentals because uh, uh, anybody living in that place, we give property rights to the person who is living, irrespective of who built it. So, this is very clear. And uh, second thing, yes, technology, I am really thankful to my team. Uh, I think uh, uh, the team is uh, here also. So uh, we did master plans and everything here, digitized that. And then in the process, we kind of strengthened our GIS team here. So we have this capability of kind of drone surveys and processing of the images and kind of uh, 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 kind of basically laying all these layers here and uh, the team actually uh, did it very fast. Actually, if you ask me, then uh, I had certain doubts about it, but uh, I am very thankful to them that uh, they kind of uh, rose to the occasion and did beyond our expectation. It, and it has been quite helpful here because uh, uh, I would like to tell that this is the election year for the government of Punjab. So we are going uh, in next three, four, in next four months, we are going for election. And uh, it is becomes very difficult, the field level to be more transparent and objective in the in these times. So you would appreciate that the pressure, full set pressures are there, but because of this technological involvement, all done, all data coming to us through mobile applications, all areas mapped, so that really helped us. And uh, once the people knew that uh, uh, everything is visible from Chandigarh, from the headquarters, there was little room for them to do stuff. And they were able to, the, and in fact, the pressure which was to be there on the field staff was not there only because of this, because of this transparency. And uh, second thing, because of this, uh, we could kind of display our list quite transparently and the objections which we received were very minuscule because of this transparency. Had it been not that transparent and we if, had we not used our technology, then it would have been very difficult to kind of get objections and resolve that and we would not um, have been able to kind of uh, uh, go to these six to something uh, such a short period of time. Uh, with regard to proprietary rights, uh, after the survey and everything, once it is approved by the steering committee, obviously the local committee finalizes and more or less um, we approve it from here. And uh, uh, the proprietary rights in case of uh, the stipulated land, if it, uh, the person is uh, uh, in occupation of that stipulated size of land, 30 square meter, 45 square meter, 60 square meter, as the case may be, they are immediately given uh, uh, the proprietary rights there. In case of the people uh, who have occupied more than the specified land, we give eligibility certificate and tell him that in next 20 installments, you can pay this much. So it comes out to be the one installment comes out to be like 200, 300 rupees, that kind of stuff. So uh, that is very useful. And we have given an eligibility certificate to them. And once they are able to, they are uh, ready to, or they have paid this, these installments, property rights will be given to them. Yeah, it's also good that you are working on state-owned land, right? So we have also yeah. a case here in Rio de Janeiro where the state government just launched a law and said, okay, all public state can be used for social housing purposes and, and the social yeah. needs. Um, uh, Mati and uh, Joy, just a final, you know, sh very short refle reflection from each of you before we go to the international pan panelists. Uh, starting with you, Mati, lots of questions about what happens after, uh, you know, if people pay taxes, you know, how are you dealing with the migration flows? So uh, questions about, you know, sustainability um, that are, are posted there. People are also very curious about the capacity to implement, but maybe just a short reflection from, from each of you. Mati? Yeah, see, after, once the land rights certificates are given a copy, uh, there are five copies of the land rights certificate. One is given to the beneficiary. The remaining four get into the system. It goes to the revenue authorities, various levels, including the record 
uh, rooms of the district. So they are all kept there and the land, revenue land correction also, map correction also is done. Uh, 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 kind, uh, kind of marking the, uh, the land right of the beneficiary in the revenue records. That's done. Based on that, the, the property tax and the, the, land, the land tax also are collected by the respective authorities. The municipal authorities as well as the revenue authorities collect their respective uh, taxes. This one. Second thing is that there is another question that uh, the uh, how do we take care of the growing population? So that once once the habit see a new habitat, the existing population is taken care of. Existing families are uh, relocated and accommodated. So then again depends upon the natural growth process. So that you cannot actually, you cannot provide for the future growth right now. You have to keep the, 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 the issue is that the cities are not equipped to take the migration. That is, that is the fundamental problem is that the, the, that's the reason why the slums are formed. The slums are formed because there are no enough space or land for the low income people who migrate into the cities. So unless we solve that fundamental problem, unless you construct construction workers' dormitories, migrant laborers' dormitories, rental housing for the low-income settlements, low-income group, so you will not be able to prevent formation of slums. So we are only trying to address the existing problem. We can, we can make the cities slum-free, but it, we will not be able to prevent formation of future slum. So for that, we are working on slum proofing. So how do we slum proof a city? What are the reasons for formation of slums and what are required to be done to preempt formation of slums? How do you provide for affordable land and uh, 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 space, constructed space, so that you are giving an opportunity for the low income people to uh, uh, cons either construct a house or pay a nominal rent and settle down rather than creating slums or adding density to the existing slums. We are working on it. That would be part of our phase three or phase four exercise. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's too much, right, for the state to deal with alone, right? So maybe you need proper, stronger policies um, to deal with the migration flows throughout the country. Um, Ajay? So uh, I had a look uh, uh, at certain questions which are coming on the screen. So uh, as far as the uh, slum proofing is concerned, as Matissa rightly said, the government of India is also kind of mulling over it, thinking over it. And uh, uh, recently, uh, our Secretary Housing and Urban Affairs visited Ludhiana for uh, looking at, uh, for reviewing these schemes. And uh, obviously, uh, we have been definitely working in kind of tandem with government of India to see that uh, slums do not happen in the sense that uh, working on the thing so that the slums do not develop further. Uh, so, but the questions were like, uh, one question was some Bengali population are not given this kind of uh, rights. So in case of Punjab, we don't kind of differentiate between whether it is Punjabi slum dweller or he's come from Tamil Nadu or Bengal. So irrespective of uh, caste, creed, or from where he comes, so irrespective of that, we are giving property rights. There is no kind of uh, discrimination between uh, them. Uh, in case of Chandigarh, there was a question about Chandigarh. So Chandigarh is not a part of Punjab. So uh, Chandigarh is a union territory. I cannot uh, uh, kind of comment on that, but uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, we are uh, kind of uh, uh, one thing I would like to say is that in our case, the certificates are given in the name of both husband and wife. In fact, uh, the uh, uh, female member's name comes first and then the male member. So it's kind of uh, uh, empowerment of women in some sense also. So uh, now the second phase we are taking up with property rights, we are taking up the development all, of all these uh, uh, some also many of the slums, slums. In fact, uh, I missed a slide where we said in many of our slums we are we have already provided drinking water and the street lights and roads. But in rest of the places, we are kind of working on that. And in next uh, couple of months, 
those will be uh, we will be ready with that so that's it from my side yeah thank you ajoy and very i'm very grateful that you mentioned this gender approach which is very very key and fundamental yeah thank you for that so yeah let, let's move to indonesia then i see uh three devis uh online uh, welcome. Uh, we know each other already. We have been exchanging before. Uh, Indonesia is a remarkable case to of a national level approach. Um, Tree is director of housing and settlement at the Ministry of National Development Planning, uh, uh, Planning National Development Agency uh, from Indonesia. Uh, her bio is, is detailed there. So Tree, welcome. I hand over to you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna Claudia. Let me share screen. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. It's, yeah. Can everybody yeah. see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for talking in this a uh, very important uh, forum. Uh, reimagining inclusive cities in the COVID-19 area. I think it's a very uh, what you call, uh, important uh, uh, topics uh, that we all are uh, facing, yeah, especially in the urban context. So uh, I'm I'm as uh, has been uh, introduced by Anna Claudia. I'm the director for housing settlement, and I'm working at the national level government. Uh, specifically in National Development Planning Agency, who is responsible for coordinating uh, all the sectors. Uh, and and uh, I'm uh, specifically for housing and settlement. So it will involve several ministries as, as well as the local governments. Uh, so uh, so in that perspective, maybe I will present uh, my, my presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, the issue of uh, slum or inclusive cities uh, 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 is now becoming a very, very uh, uh, been the, the attention of everybody, especially when we are facing a, a growth, a significant growth in urban population. And Indonesia is also facing the same uh, trend. So Indonesia is the fourth country of the world with the highest urban population. Well, the total population is 273 million, maybe only a fifth of India, but still a big number comparing to other uh, countries. And 56% of Indonesia population live in urban areas and it's going to grow uh, quite rapidly, 2.7% so far. Uh, every year, so we will reach uh, around almost 70% by 2045. So, and uh, and uh, we are also facing a, a big uh, gap, especially Java and outer Java. So we have we are an island, archipelagic country, and there are five big uh, islands. One of uh, one of the most populous island is Java, where lives 60% of the population, Indonesian population lives in Java. So 60% is almost 150 million, 150, 160 million people live in Java. And uh, with the projection of Indonesia, urban population will reach 70%, while in Java, it will almost 90% of urban population. So in Java, the, the, the issue will be very, uh, much bigger than uh, compared to other uh, island in Indonesia. Uh, unfortunately, our urban growth is not, uh, what do you call it, uh, a company with a, 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 a growth return. I mean, you know, by uh, uh, the data that we have uh, have a, a study with uh, the World Bank as well, uh, every 1% increase in urban population only uh, a company with 1.4% uh, of economic uh, na, income per capita, growth of income per capita. So if we compare with other countries in Asia and Pacific region, this one is quite low compared to China and other is Asia and Pacific developing countries. One of the, uh, the culprit or one of the uh, reason uh, that we have analyzed is one uh, is also about the, uh, the infrastructure that is still lacking in the, in the urban area, as well as the uh, areas of not uh, uh, not uh, livable. I mean, uh, 
uh, many areas in the in the in the country that are not really providing uh, 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 environment that people can grow and live uh, 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 productively. So uh, there are only uh, in urban area. So this uh, uh, I'll give you some uh, more detailed data. And uh, sixty one percent urban household live in adequate housing so the rest is live in, in inadequate houses this means is um, uh, uh, more than 15.5 million 15 million households is a big number for us so some of it may be in slum area so they may uh, live in the same area but some of them are scattered uh, in uh, other areas as well uh, although it, uh, the number of inadequate housing in urban area is uh, lower than in urban in rural area but uh, with the characteristic of rural and urban uh, where land is not really an issue maybe in, in the rural area while it is a very big uh, cost uh, factor cost factor for uh, uh, providing housing in uh, urban then uh, and more complicated uh, issue in urban than uh, uh, this 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 uh, gap still uh, more serious in urban areas. Uh, uh, more majority of those household live in uh, inadequate housing. Again, it is in Java. So West Java, Jakarta, province is Java. Banten is also in Java. Uh, western part of the West Java and Central Java. So it, where the largest metropolitan areas are located in Indonesia. Uh, and 3.9 million urban households live in overcrowded houses. Uh, so with this uh, condition, one, one in five urban residents in Indonesia live in slum areas, and the ratio is, as mentioned, uh, one of the cost factor for providing housing is land, a ratio of housing prices uh, to income in Jakarta and other big cities, especially metropolitan areas, are even higher than New York maybe because of the income is also lower than in other, but uh, how the prices, price, housing price is increasing is, is not uh, caught up by the income uh, increase of the people. And most of the people, house, people who live in inadequate household, uh, 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 around 70% are coming from the informal sectors. So again, this may uh, hinder us, hinder them to uh, accessing uh, financial uh, uh, subsidy or financial uh, facility that is provided by the government or uh, local government. Uh, of course, this I think this has been the the why we need to ensure that no one lives in slum. I think this is also in line with the topic of this uh, forum, uh, inclusive city. Uh, but also uh, it, uh, providing a life a healthy environment for everybody so they can product to be uh, to to do uh, productive activities uh, as well as uh, healthy in terms of covid-19 uh, tb and so on so uh, i think uh, this has been uh, the the our, our uh, understand by all, everybody that this is why it is important so in our policy, in the national policy especially, uh, although we have the autonomy at the level of municipality and districts, but uh, with the fiscal uh, politics maybe or fiscal composition, uh, uh, local government is still actually still really dependent to the national uh, government. So, uh, so, uh, and especially with the policy uh, program and so on, they also uh, really uh, rely on the uh, national uh, policy or program. So it is it is good in one way that we will then we have uh, 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 opportunity to work together. But of course, we uh, we also uh, it, it's not really. Uh, empowering the local government. It's, it's difficult to empower the uh, local government to do something uh, innovative or something that is uh, uh, breakthrough in, in, in their uh, local uh, context. But of course, it's still important to set up the national uh, policy and strategy. Uh, and the main policy is to increase household access to uh, decent, safe, and affordable housing and settlements in order to, of course, create inclusive and liable cities. 
so in this uh, policy we have uh, we see it from three perspectives something or, or at least two perspectives in the supply side and, and the demand side in the demand side we're trying to help the households to really access the uh, uh, what do you call it uh, to to empower them uh, financially especially uh, so they can access uh, uh, any financial facility or financial uh, mechanism to uh, access uh, uh, housing uh, adequate housing and uh, inclusive I mean, decent and safe uh, affordable housing uh, and also uh, this one is uh, although we, we we have a big uh, what you call subsidy or we call it flpp uh, this give a uh, subsidy to the uh, low income household uh, to access uh, affordable housing uh, but uh, if this one uh, in this scheme we will cooperate with the bank uh, uh, financial institution but again with for for the informal uh, household it will be difficult to access the bank because they, they need guarantee uh, they need to approve that they have income and so on so we also built some a scheme for no, uh, informal uh, household as well. This one is also a challenge because not uh, uh, more most of the big uh, uh, financial institution uh, will have uh, what a high risk and then they have to manage that risk and so on. So uh, we're trying to uh, build a, a, a subsidy based on uh, savings that can be. Uh, Saved by the informal uh, household, informal uh, sector household, and in the supply strategy, of course, we trying to provide as many as affordable housing. But again, this uh, need uh, collaboration with the local governments because uh, they are the one who will then uh, manage this housing, uh, public housing or social housing uh, that is integrated as well with the uh, slum upgrading, slum alleviation, and so on. Uh, and also integrated with the basic housing infrastructure. Again, uh, we have uh, a, a, a bit different, maybe different structure. Housing is uh, handled by one, uh, uh, although it is, it is in one ministry, but it is uh, handled by different unit uh, between housing and basic infrastructure. And sometimes it doesn't really uh, in line what they build, or what they program. So we're trying to uh, make sure that they all are integrated. And enabling environment, of course, we all know how we can uh, 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 building standards, uh, licensing, land administration, uh, 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 institutional arrangement, uh, and so on. Uh, and the programs, uh, we have housing finance subsidy, as I mentioned before, but of course, still, as I mentioned, it is uh, now the big part is still uh, is more accessible for in formal uh, income households. Uh, again, we're trying to uh, develop more for informal income also. Provision of no housing, including development of public housing. We have a target of 1 million public housing these uh, five years. But so it's a bit, it's, it's struggling with this pandemic as well. And then housing improvement program. So we are, because 80%, um, uh, more, I think maybe more, more than 80% of houses is, is self supply by the the household is not uh, accessed by uh, they, they don't access it through the floppers or formal market yeah so they they build their own house sometimes it's not a substandard sometimes it's uh, it's not safe and so on so we also giving housing improvement program or uh, giving financial uh uh, we call it stimulant, uh, stimulant for the household to improve their uh, housing condition. And then of course, the integrated slum upgrading this because uh, we have 10 million, 10 metropolitan areas around Indonesia from uh, Java and Java is five metropolitan areas and five uh, in outside, uh, outside uh, Java Island. Uh, and maybe almost 100,000 hectares of slum area uh, nationally. Uh, it's a big number and it's a big uh, area. So we, we, uh, we, we are also have an integrated slum upgrading uh, program. But of course, it's not as easy as said, many different cases, many different approaches that we need to make sure in the local context. But we see that in, in achieving cities without slum, Sorry, uh, there are 
at least six aspects that we need to make sure before we do it uh, together with the local government as well as the local community. First, it needs to be uh, in line with the spatial planning, how it will uh, connect to the connectivity, uh, uh, it is uh, in suitable land and so on. It's not in a, uh, maybe disaster prone areas and so on. So it needs to be uh, there. And then basic infrastructure and housing provision is need to be integrated because again, as I said, sometimes it doesn't because it was done by different unit in a uh, in ministry. Sometimes it, uh, one uh, goes that way and the another goes another way. So we need to make sure that they are in, in, in integrated approach. And then land, again, land is, uh, is in Indonesia, land can be owned, of course, maybe it's also similar to other countries, can be owned by private uh, entity, and there is no limitation how big land you can own. So uh, as, as long as you have money, uh, and it happens, uh, people are uh, accumulating their land, especially developers, or uh, who is uh, have their business in property and so on, uh, they, they they accumulating a land ownership and uh, causing land price uh, very uh, uh, increase very quite uh, rapidly. So um, and people who ha doesn't have capital again uh, is being more and more difficult to access land as uh, as well as housing uh, housing adequate housing. And then uh, financing it is also need to be. Uh, how we can finance this? It's also a, uh, something that we need to 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 make sure that it is uh, uh, thought totally uh, totally fu uh, fully thought in this uh, uh, slum upgrading or slum uh, alleviation program. And then how we also upgrading the economic capacity of the community because uh, usually they are the, they are uh, working in the informal sectors with low income house uh, with low income uh, we need to make sure they, they if they are being uh, relocate or being uh, their, their, their slum area is being upgraded uh, they they can maintain their level of uh, life or even increase their their, their capacity uh, especially in the economic way so they, they can uh, manage to live uh, better uh, 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 I think there is also a big shift in our uh, national uh, uh, pro policy uh, before maybe before this period of uh, government we focus more on slum upgrading with uh, one of the big uh, project that we have with uh, the World Bank is National uh, Slum Upgrading uh, Project, NSUP. It's been uh, conducted from 2016 until now. It's uh, almost closing this year. Uh, this is the, the last uh, year. But of oh, course, this one uh, saw us that uh, because the scheme is still limited to the provision of basic infrastructure, it's not even touching the housing condition. So we see that, of course, the the so it, it it's only uh, upgrading the 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 condition of the 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 condition of the visual condition maybe, uh, if I can say, uh, of the slum uh, area. But re doesn't really if you go to the heavy slum area, it's still a challenge to do this approach because they they need also intervention to the housing condition or to the uh, regularity of the uh, housing itself. And this uh, kotaku uh, we call it NSUP uh, is not yet uh, provide that 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 uh, approach. And it doesn't really uh, pay attention to the prevention. So again, it's uh, looking at the condition, and then it will. It, it is uh, still limited, touching the mild condition of a slum area, mild slum area. So we we trying to move to more comprehensive slum alleviation. We 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 now have trying to uh, have a urban slum slum or uh, urban regeneration program a uh, slum uh, regeneration or slum uh, alleviation uh, but also in uh, it, it, together with slum prevention uh, uh, this uh, uh, slum prevention we looking at uh, new settlements providing uh, 
supply, how, how, how the quote housing supply that is affordable by the uh, low income household, uh, but also uh, looking at the existing settlements that need to be uh, uh, regenerate or revitalized and uh, so on. So again, we, we see uh, from uh, six different uh, aspects as well. Uh, with this, uh, with that approach, we, we, we several uh, local government, uh, again, with the help of, of course, a collaboration, uh, although some of the, the trigger is also from the Kotaku uh, scheme, and it was uh, trigger that we need to do something with for the heavy slum area or something that cannot be just just for with the basic infrastructure or the the, uh, or the visual uh, visual upgrading so we need to have a more uh, comprehensive approach uh, one of the example that has been uh, done by the local government uh, of course with uh, collaboration as well with the village uh, government as well as uh, uh, national uh, government uh, it's in uh, Gorontalo. One, it, it is uh, quite far from Java actually. Uh, again, uh, they have a, a very good program in uh, how they develop rumah sehat komunal or healthy, uh, safe uh, household uh, community co com communal. Uh, through the program, uh, 699 houses in 18 sub district were built, and this program has impact on reducing poverty, also increasing access to safety, clean water, and sanitation. So, first, local government selected several low income households living in adequate houses from every village in Pahuato, in this city, in this uh, district, uh, although in the urban areas of the district. Uh, they then uh, relocate. They given uh, uh, a new uh, property uh, land uh, rights uh, with adequate house for free in new area bought by the local government. So every house is equipped with basic infrastructure, such as electricity, drinking water, and sanitation facilitation facilities. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we really run out of time. We need to. Any minutes I have. The next presenter. Okay, so this is one of the examples that. Uh, uh, have they approached uh, more comprehensive and more in a uh, heavy slum area. One, uh, once again, another one is in South Sumatra uh, for street sweeper and scavengers, uh, scavenger. So it's an uh, informal sector. Uh, they also, uh, again, local government buy the uh, land, giving to the, uh, uh, the, the, the household uh, with uh, a core housing unit, uh, 27 meter uh, square meter worth of is around 6,000 uh, US dollar. There is also for other four months fixed income uh, household as well in South Sumatra. And then one, uh, again, both the other two examples are for landed housing. But for metropolitan areas, sometimes it's, it's, it's impossible to build uh, landed housing. For example, the, the one in Jakarta, we need to build a, a vertical housing in in in, in limited land uh, available in urban area. So this one, where it, previously it was like the picture in the left, uh, there are uh, lion uh, uh, fish fishermen living in 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 the tip of uh, Jakarta near the sea. Uh, so there are 214 slum household. Uh, the land is still uh, uh, owned by the local government, but they are providing the housing, the government providing the housing, uh, vertical housing for this, 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 this uh, slum household. They live with, in current area without being relocated, but they need to um, uh, maintain uh, this uh, household and they have to pay for uh, some kind of uh, rent. But the rent and, 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 and so on is, uh, managed by the community itself, but of course under the supervision of the local government. Uh, so with this approach, we, I mean, we're trying to provide the financial uh, 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 support as well to the local government who has a big, uh, who has a good program like Pahuato, South Sumatra or Jakarta and uh, uh, others. Uh, I will show you some others uh, uh, who has implemented uh, this fund, uh, who has uh, utilized this financial uh, incentive for, from, from the national government. We provide this uh, since last year. Uh, so we provide uh, the, what we call a special allocation fund that will uh, not just uh, 
uh, give apa, uh, support for the development of the house housing that is needed by the slum areas household, but also drinking water system, roads, drainage, and uh, domestic wastewater management system, and stimulant fund for self help housing. So it, there are two types: relocation as well as loan consolidation. This one is uh, land consolidation uh, in Surakarta in Java. It's a good one. It's a very good one. If you uh, have the time, maybe you can uh, visit this sometime, maybe virtually as well as uh, directly. Uh, so it was uh, 584 household living in some area, like the picture in the left. And then now they, they, we have a land regulation. So they live in the same area. Uh, the, the land is owned by the local government, but then uh, they're given the land rights to the uh, each household that uh, well, of 584 and also we give a stimulant to build the house so they have a house now and it, the progress now is a construction for the housing there are so this, yeah, i'm really sorry i have to <laughs> the go too of, short um, utilize the special allocation fund so thank you very much i hope it helps and it it gives you a lot a lot i'm really sorry for doing that because it was yeah um, <laughs> So, uh, but uh, we can share these slides with, with the participants. Thank you. That was the last one. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so, Faisal, um, Durban has been also a pioneer in terms of slum upgrading. There is a national policy in South Africa, but also equally as Indonesia, and I believe it's, it's, a, it's a common sense in the Global South, we are all facing, uh, you know, serious challenges uh, in, in scaling up, in, you know, for the sustainability of the project. So uh, Faiso is a senior manager, uh, planning human settlements unit and at the Quini municipality uh, known as Durban. So Faiso, hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Anna Claudia, and thanks for the opportunity for being able to share some of uh, our experiences here at uh, uh, Durban in uh, Itequini municipality. I'm going to share my presentation. Um, is, that, is that showing? Yes. Okay, so it's gonna make it into a... No, it's okay, a beautiful, so, uh, yeah, it's a presentation mode. Okay, great. Um, okay, so in, in, the, uh, in the municipality, um, We've, um, we've got a population of uh, roughly 4 million uh, people and uh, uh, we're sitting with a, a housing backlog of which 65% comprises uh, informal settlements. So we've got roughly 587 uh, informal settlements comprising 300 and just over 312,000 households. And that's nearly a, you know, just over a quarter of the city's population. Uh, this continued urbanization and the scarcity of well-located land. Lots, lots of our land in the municipality is either, you know, uh, steep or has environmental constraints, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lots of topographic uh, constraints. Uh, and based on the number of subsidies that we receive from national government, uh, it will take us, you know, over well over 80 years to meet that backlog. Um, um, what we have done is we've categorized all our informal settlements uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, A, B1, B2, and a C. Um, a being a settlement that can be easily upgraded. Uh, B1 is an incremental institute upgrade with some essential services. A B2 is a deferred relocation and a C is, is uh, an urgent relocation. So fortunately, 78% of our settlements are, are category B1, uh, which, is, which is good. Uh, the municipality has taken an in principle decision to upgrade informal settlements wherever they are located, uh, provided there is no, uh, uh, you know, danger to to residents uh, residing in these in these settlements. Um, and and what's remarkable is less than three percent of the households are earmarked for complete relocation. Um, uh, the other significant um, factor is that. 41% of the land that is uh, settled is, is in private ownership. And that's something that, that we have to deal with. And I will cover that later in the slides. So just giving you an example of, of the type of densities we, we're dealing with. Uh, this is a typical uh, settlement that is pretty well located 
And uh, in that one hectare, uh, the, the blue uh, square, uh, we're looking at 300 uh, plus minus 300 uh, structures. Uh, so that's a density of 300 dwelling units per, per hectare. Um, this is another example of, of an informal settlement that's established uh, in, within a uh, well-developed um, suburb, uh, middle-class suburb in the city. Um, using the, the, the government subsidy program, uh, we've been able to transform our settlements into either single-story uh, units or double-story or even uh, triple stories, which we are currently uh, experimenting with. Um, and uh, I'm just going to quickly go to this slide, which uh, very, uh, in summary, gives you an idea of, of the different subsidy programs. So upgrading of informal settlements is not the only um, subsidy program available to us. Uh, we've got, um, you know, there's, there's rental housing subsidies, there's rural housing subsidies, um, there's community residential units that looks at hostels. So there are a number of subsidies available, but we go, we'll just concentrate on, on the subsidy that deals with informal settlement upgrading. Um, and in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, it's a 40 square meter, minimum 40 square meter uh, structure that's provided by, by government. It's free to those uh, beneficiaries who qualify for the subsidies. It's a fully serviced site. Uh, you know, title deed to the land is provided. Uh, you know, there's road access where, where, wherever possible. Uh, so it's it's a pretty you know uh, well uh, well serviced uh, you know top structure that's that's provided. Uh, we can go up to two three stories um, based on on the funding based on the topography that's available, and of course you know the funding that's available or allocated for that particular uh, financial year. For us to go because the higher we go, the more expensive it gets. Um, so uh, what we've done is uh, we've discovered that that uh, this particular program, um, the conventional, well we call it the breaking new ground BNG program, uh, is not sustainable. Um, although uh, you know as as a as a country there have been over four million subsidies provided through this program uh, within the city. Uh, we've had over 200,000 beneficiaries um, that have benefited. Um, at the end of the day, it's not just something that's um, sustainable, especially in light of uh, you know, uh, fiscal constraints and, and also um, a, a lack of uh, well-located and developable land in, in the city. So what we did as a city, we, we looked at an incremental services approach um, and it was uh, one way we did not provide a, a top structure or a house, but rather we, we provided, you know, bas basic water sanitation, road and foot road and uh, footpath access, and electricity provision. Uh, there was no formal security of tenure at this stage. It was more, uh, you know, um, uh, what you call this. It was a, an administrative uh, uh, right, or, or, or you know, it was a special recognition given to informal settlements, provided they could be upgraded. Um, and so land wasn't uh, a criteria to be uh, acquired upfront. Um, and by this program, we managed to, you know, make, make quite, a, quite significant improvements to the lives of, of many, um, uh, you know, residents um, uh, residing in, uh, uh, in these settlements, uh, you know, with, its, with sanitation blocks, communal sanitation blocks with uh, electrical, individual electrical connections, with the water supply, uh, with roads and footpaths uh, and stormwater controls, uh, the city had made, uh, you know, huge advances in in uh, reducing, um, you know, or improving the health and safety of people. So these are some of the examples of the roads and footpaths that we we provided. Uh, the communal ablution blocks, uh, you know, one 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 block which had a, a male and female. Uh, you know, um, uh, section um, uh, could serve between 50 to 75 households um, in a settlement. We also uh, advanced to providing early childhood development centers in some of uh, the settlements as part of the incremental program. Um, so uh, the bottom line was instead of providing, um, you know, or, or you know, 
a subsidy to, to one family with that same amount of money, we were able to service between 10 to 15 households. Uh, and, and in that way, uh, we were able to reach far more uh, residents uh, uh, in, this, in these settlements. Um, the, the roads and layouts were, um, were designed such a way that they would, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't be changed. They would be there for the, for the final upgrade of the settlement. So there wouldn't be any of costs. There were opportunities for emerging uh, contractors uh, uh, to be uh, employed. Uh, caretakers were employed from the community to look after the communal ablution blocks. And there were a number of parallel LED initiatives uh, initiated by, by the city as well. Uh, so this particular program, the incremental program, which focused on basic services, uh, has been implemented by the city since 2010. Um, and um, it has evolved into, you know, uh, the city now categorizing all its informal settlements as per national guidelines. We're in the process of undertaking a, a pipeline planning um, uh, uh, program. Uh, we are looking at dealing with, with uh, the provision of services on, on privately owned land. We're looking at uh, new 10 year arrangements. Um, and uh, the bottom line is, is a differentiated approach to uh, servicing informal settlements, upgrading informal settlements was required uh, due to a number of challenges uh, within, within, uh, with, that the city was, was uh, faced with. Um, we also developed a comprehensive informal settlement database um, that provided you know, um, uh, numerous um, data fields uh, that, that informed our strategic planning and informed our integrated uh, uh, planning and budgeting um, uh, coordination. Um, we uh, established a, a, a monthly forum uh, where key line departments within the municipality were able to discuss uh, interventions in informal settlement and, and, and you know, uh, better integrate our, our, our different initiatives uh, to informal settlements. And, and, and quite significantly, we also developed partnerships uh, with, with key NGOs and, and civil society organizations as well in the process. <clears throat> so the new optimized approach to, to upgrading had to be inclusive and citywide, had to be inc incremental, it had to be you know, in situ with relocations being uh, the, uh, a last resort, partnership-based, participative, programmatic and area-based. It had to be differentiated and, and, and flexible. Um, and you know, key elements of, of, of a strategy, a citywide strategy, which we, we, hence, uh, you know, we, which we subsequently uh, developed um, is, is that the, the state, um, the current state-funded housing and formalization program um, was not sustainable, which I mentioned uh, earlier. And this incremental approach um, is something that, that we had to step up and, and, and advance um, and, and augment um, with, uh, with a number of uh, new, um, what you call this, uh, mechanisms um, uh, and to tailor make it in terms of meeting uh, local conditions. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we dealt with, uh, you know, our, our legal departments, for instance, uh, in terms of how we would, um, you know, address uh, servicing of privately owned land. And, and we got senior council opinions on how to go about doing it. It was the, the you know, development of, of uh, a municipal bylaw. Uh, it was the development of uh, statutory servitudes that will protect municipal infrastructure on the ground. Um, it was the development of uh, incremental development areas, uh, development of uh, temporary development areas, which could be uh, uh, what you call this, uh, integrated into our uh, spatial development framework. So the informal settlements are recognized and they become part, part of the city. Um, so the, 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 the priorities for, for the strategic pipeline has been uh, achieving minimum uh, level of acceptable services. That was our, our key target. Uh, responding proactively to, to high-risk um, informal settlements. Importantly, 
spatial restructuring. So trying to, uh, you know, prioritize those uh, settlements that were well located uh, in terms of the city's uh, spatial plans, building assets and land value so that, you know, well located settlements um, or people living in well located settlements have uh, the confidence to improve their, 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 their homes. Um, looking at um, incremental planning and tenure arrangements uh, with our development and planning uh, departments, um, optimizing the use of limited fiscal resources um, and mitigating or removing severe and imminent safety threats in, in, in settlements uh, and also reducing environmental and other public harm. So in terms of uh, the exercise that we had undertaken, we were, we, we were able to identify, uh, you know, uh, from, from all the 587 informal settlements, that 35% of them were, 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 were best located, B1 category settlements. There were 26 uh, general settlements. Um, uh, the B2s were 23, category C were, were 6%. And in this way, we were able to identify um, tailor-made uh, interventions uh, for these settlements where, uh, through the provision of, of services, uh, through uh, proposed tenure arrangements, uh, looking at, at the budget that we had available uh, for that particular financial year. So in terms of how, how, we, how we prioritize, it was the vulnerability uh, you know, uh, of, of uh, settlements in terms of health and safety threats, uh, and so this, this was the overriding uh, criteria, uh, what services deficit was, uh, uh, was prevalent in, in settlements, did they have a lack, <clears throat> a lack of sanitation, water, was electricity, we were able to identify these, uh, how dense the informal settlement was, the more dense, the more vulnerable, uh, how long the settlement uh, has been uh, awaiting services, uh, community re readiness, and, and also location was, was taken in, uh, into account uh, in determining how, how we, we, we selected them. I'm, I'm gonna run quite quickly through the slides, it's quite a few, so we, we'll make, uh, I'll make the, uh, the presentation available uh, to, to colleagues. So some of the current innovative upgrading initiatives has been you know, the, the city identifying uh, collaborative informal settlement action as a, a, a resilient strategy uh, in the city. So it, it, it uh, sort of uh, enjoyed a strategic status. Um, um, we also, uh, as part of that uh, um, resilience um, initiative, we were able to get uh, funding from, from the United Kingdom Prosperity Fund, the UKPF, uh, and, and, and a, a sub-project from this has been the Informal Settlement Information Management uh, System that looks at uh, the uh, you know, integration of city-level data together with community-based data in order to make uh, more informed uh, decision on, decisions on how we go about addressing informal settlements. Uh, we've been part of a number of national programs um, uh, looking at innovative upgrading. Um, we've got a, a European funded project called Casa Leto, which I'll touch on later. Uh, there have been private sector partnerships. There's, there's also been the MOA signed between the city and the South African Shack Dwellers International Alliance. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's an upgrading forum that, that, that the departments meet, and this, this is critical in terms of getting, you know, uh, some of the line departments that don't take informal settlements quite seriously. Uh, and it, we, we, we managed to send the message across that informal settlements are a, a city responsibility, not a responsibility just for, a, for the human settlements or the housing unit uh, alone. Um, the, through the national government, we, we've uh, been allocated a, a grant of 686 million rand for uh, uh, informal settlement upgrading over and above the, the, the normal housing subsidy grant. And this is the money that we're going to, or not going to, but we, we, we have to, as part, part of the criteria, um, apply to uh, projects that, that, that uh, will uh, deal with improving the lives of uh, uh, residents in informal settlements. We have undertaken the categorization as, as I um, alluded to earlier, uh, the project pipeline um, has been developed. Uh, we've been uh, liaising with our water and sanitation department in terms of looking at more innovative and sustainable 
solutions uh, to uh, the, the cab, which are currently provided, becoming a, a huge operational and maintenance um, issue. Uh, so how do we get even you know, local communities involved in, in, in taking responsibility for, for the o &M, um issues around um, communal ablution blocks? Um, we are looking at the alternative tenure, land rights, incremental planning solutions, um, basically being more flexible um, and um, getting informal settlements uh, recognized into the city's plans uh, going forward. Uh, the Casa Leto project uh, I, I alluded to earlier is, uh, you know, uh, it's looking at developing and mobilizing capacity uh, and strengthening upgrading partnerships uh, with, uh, with all stakeholders. It's also looking at strengthening inst institutional arrangements um, uh, within, within the city and within government departments as well. Um, we've uh, um, identified 10 uh, pilot projects as part of the Casa Leto uh, project. Um, we've managed to get funding uh, for these, uh, effect, which will affect uh, just close to 9,000 households. Uh, and we made significant prog progress uh, in terms of creating community partnerships, looking at, at uh, alternative planning uh, solutions. Um, and um, uh, the, the idea behind Ikaza Letu is, is these 10 pilots would help us scale up uh, this initiative through the plus 500 informal settlements that we have. Uh, core to, to this uh, new approach has been the, the what you call this uh, initiation of um, a, a services frame into settlements where the uh, number of uh, relocations are, are reduced um, and, and, and not up to uh, formal first world standards. Um, uh, there is an ability in partnership with, with the community to make spaces or make space for services to be easily introduced into a settlement. Um, and in, in that way, uh, the, the, the entire settlement uh, has the opportunity of getting a very basic level of service with minimum uh, relocations uh, involved. Um, this is an example of, of, of the um, services frame introduced in the, in the Parkington informal settlement with minimal relocations and where relocations were identified, uh, we have managed to de develop the lift housing unit, which is a lightweight improved fire safe uh, and, and timber frame uh, unit, uh, specially built to uh, be accommodated on, on the very steep slopes, which we encounter in, in our city. Um, and the, the bottom line is this alternative technology, um, uh, lightweight and, and uh, improved and, and affordable, gives the, the residents uh, the hope and the, uh, you know, the, the catalyst to be able to improve their own homes. Um, um, you know, significantly over time, uh, rather than waiting for a government subsidy to be provided. And they, and they would wait a long time for, for, for such a subsidy to be made available. Faisal, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but we are running short of time. And you may like to conclude in a couple of minutes, please. Sure. This will be my, I think, one of my last slides. So this is, um, this is uh, the uh, left unit. 150 would be built uh, this year uh, within the pilots. And um, what can we expand on? I think it's meaningful, meaningful community mobilization and participation is, is essential. Uh, I think we, you know, the, the self-help uh, and, and social cap, uh, building social capital is going to make more, to make communities more resilient. Uh, resilient. Um, um, there is, I think, um, not all settlements uh, require the same product uh, or the tenure option. I think we need to acknowledge that. There's no uh, size, you know, one size fits all, doesn't work. Um, incremental infrastructure over time uh, is, I think, necessary. Uh, Homeowner education is, is essential. Uh, partnerships, partnerships with CBOs and NGOs, even universities is essential. Uh, transversal management, 
uh, I think is critical within within the city and within government. Um, and uh, I think not just the provision of basic services, but I think you know local economic development in initiatives, um, early childhood development, are all um, you know uh, the, the the softer uh, what you call this interventions that 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 are necessary to to create uh, sustainable uh, communities. Thank you. Thanks very much, Faisal. Uh, uh, very interesting presentation indeed. Uh, I think you have highlighted the need for a citywide strategy and more importantly, the nuts and bolts of doing it. The importance of focusing on service delivery rather than land tenure, the focus on slum upgrading at large and the, and the need for developing partnerships uh, not only developing, I would say incubating partnerships and nurturing them or a long phased implementation program. Thanks very much, uh, Faisal. And my compliments sure. to the presenters, Mr. Mativatnam, Mr. Ajish Sharma, uh, Virjianti and Faisal yourself. Uh, Virjianti, it's a pleasure to meet you again, uh, although on a different platform and virtually. Uh, well, as an introduction, my name is Ajay Suri. I work with the National Institute of Urban Affairs, uh, which is a part of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. And I'm heading the Inclusive Cities Center at NIUA. Uh, my meeting with and my interactions with Virjianti were while I was working with Cities Alliance in Bapana's office, as well as Kuala Lumpur when we were there for the World Urban Forum. Uh, well, uh, now, now's the time for us to move to the panel discussion and raise some time for us to raise some tricky questions with the panelists as well, which would further help unravel the mystery of slum upgrading. Look at the nuts and bolts, the, the sticky issues which have been around and which have been challenging slum upgrading as well. Uh, all of us would agree that uh, it, we need to build resilient communities to minimize the impact of man-made and natural disasters, including pandemics in terms of loss of lives and economic disruptions. Uh, what the four presenters had highlighted that the, the resilient communities and cities uh, can be fostered through slum upgrading, which may include improved housing with individual services such as water and sanitation and improved share, shared services uh, such as street paving, street lighting, solid waste management, drainage, among others. In the case of a pandemic such as COVID-19, such measures would help in adopting sanitation and social measures to minimize the spread of the disease. But probably what the presenters missed in presenting was to highlight the need for uh, open and built up community spaces in dense settlements. And this is what is required for surge infrastructure in case of disasters, including pandemics. Uh, globally, cities were able to uh, put up health facilities overnight uh, using the open spaces and built up spaces available in the cities. And the significance is equally for the slum settlements as well because this is what helps in uh, uh, delivering a quick response to the pandemic in terms of treatment facilities, isolation facilities, uh, vaccination centers amongst others. Uh, even in cities like Manila, where there is frequent or periodic uh, flooding of the informal settlements, uh, community spaces have been constructed where the household members can collect in turn uh, whenever they are faced with a flooding situation. Uh, I would like to welcome the five panelists, which include Faisal and Virjianti from the session part one. Uh, in addition, we have Dr. Renu Khosla, who's the director of Center for Regional, Urban and Regional Excellence. Uh, we have uh, Shamuli Haider, Halder from the Omidyar Network. And we have Shubhagato from Center for Policy Research. Uh, Shubhagato doesn't require any introduction since he's a part of the hosting community. I would like, you know, I would suggest that I pose a few questions to the panelists 
which you may like to respond to when you are presenting your point of view. Let me start with uh, Faisal and Virjianti. Uh, both of you would agree that slum upgrading is a gradual process and takes a number of years, 10 to 15 years for a medium sized city to turn slums into suburbs through provision of services. What is required fundamentally is the acceptance of slum dwellers as legitimate citizens and provision of services gradually in the informal settlements. Having said all this, uh, when we look at Indonesia, for example, Indonesia has this wonderful target, 100, 0, 100, where you are aiming at zero slums, 100% coverage of water and sanitation. And to meet this mission or to meet this goal, you have Kotaku, which is the national slum upgrading program concurrently you also have the community-led water and sanitation programs. But if you, when you go to the Indonesian cities, including Jakarta, cities are struggling to provide services in informal settlements because of uncertainty of tenure. Uh, you know, Faisal had mentioned that they have been providing services without considering land as the denominator or the, or the determinant. But tenure globally has been a sticky issue when we talk about slum upgrading. Anna Claudia would agree that though Brazil had adopted the city statute 20 years back, most cities are strict, still struggling to resolve the tenure issues. The progress has been very, very slow. My question to Virjianti and Faisal, how would you suggest that the cities, countries, or provinces dealing land tenure from slum upgrading? What are the policy breakthroughs in your own country, in your own city, to address the challenges that the cities and the countries have been facing? Uh, related to this, uh, and I'm drawing from the question and answers, questions posted in the chat box, uh, Vajayanti, you may like to delve more on the experience of relocating slum dwellers and in, in Indonesia and what were the challenges. Uh, Faisal, the question to you specifically is what was the community participation for housing design and or upgrading infrastructure in Durban? So over to you first Vajayanti and Faisal, then you may like to come in. And uh, please uh, uh, restrict your uh, talk to five to seven minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ajay. Uh, regarding the uncertainty of tenure, land tenure. So it is a challenge, as I said, land is uh, in Indonesia can be can own by private yeah uh, as many as you have money something like that so sometimes it's accumulated in some uh, a very few uh, person or people or very few company uh, companies so uh, like in Jakarta or in some big cities that has a very strategic uh, land uh, value uh, then it will hinder the, the 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 how people with low income uh, can access this kind of uh, land uh, that is very vital for uh, building or develop a, a house. Uh, uh, several things that we have uh, been done. I mean, we also give. So we're trying to find uh, one of the. There are several things that we we trying to do. Uh, First, we trying to indicate or identify uh, state-owned uh, or local government-owned land, uh, own land, state-owned land that is not yet utilized or underutilized. And using that to not maybe not giving the land rights like the, in Surakarta that I just gave, gave you the example before, but giving the right uh, in, in terms of ownership, but they give, they giving the right to stay there. If we, I mean, we build the public house, for example, public housing, like the one in Jakarta or in Aquarium, we build the public housing, they can rent there. 
they can render in a long term uh, uh, long term period something like that that's one one of the way we trying to provide land or space for the uh, low income housing the other one is uh, uh, and this one can be also uh, we can also use as long as we uh, agree to have an MOU, for example, with uh, some uh, state-owned uh, state-owned companies like the railway uh, company in Indonesia. They have many lands that is underutilized. We build some of public housing again or low uh, low apartment. I mean low low cost apartment. Uh, they again they. They can access this uh, uh, with a uh, uh, right to stay. What do you call it? A right to stay in English. I mean, in Bahasa Indonesia is hak uh, guna bangunan, gitu ya. Right to stay there for uh, quite long. So they they have a secure uh, secure uh, uh, have a secure security to live there at least until they uh, they die something like that. Uh, Another one is uh, uh, the, the so we use the that land uh, that is underutilized, especially that is state owned or uh, uh, state owned or uh, local government owned or state owned companies that have uh, many uh, lands. And then we also uh, like the one in uh, Surakarta, uh, the local government giving the the, 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 the the land to the people. It is an ownership right. Ownership, so they give the the parcel to the 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 the, uh, the, 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 the that that uh, parcel of land with the house to the people, so they can own, including owning the land. They have the, uh, but they cannot transfer the ownership uh, within five to ten years to make sure that the targeted beneficiaries is have a, a, a better access or better uh, access to housing as well as. Uh, living conditions. Uh, uh, in terms of that, we also have a, uh, again a, a co co collaboration with the because we have, as I said, uh, uh, the government consists of many ministries. One of the ministries is a land and agrarian uh, PPN, gitu ya, kalau di Indonesia. Uh, uh, we trying to do a land consolidation as well. So we trying to do the land consolidation as, uh, for example, the one in Surakarta. It is a landed housing, but we trying to also to do a vertical land consolidation. So if it is in a big, uh, uh, in a dense population, in dense area, uh, the people has their own their their, their land. Uh, I mean the slum dwellers own the land actually, but it's not regular regular. We need to regular regularize uh, the land, so we we have a program of land consolidation. Although we still in the process of doing that, it's not yet uh, really implemented. As you said, it is it will take urban regeneration takes ten to fifteen years. Even the one in aquarium, we take uh, we to to have the acceptance from the slum viewers, It needs four to five years. Until we can construct the the apartment, I mean the flat, uh, the public housing. Uh, again, we still in 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 for uh, vertical land consolidation. Consolidation. We we are, we trying to do this in Bandung and several places in uh, Jakarta. So that's another one. The way we we we, we how we. Uh, we manage the land uh, tenure in 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 urban uh, context for the low income housing. Uh, and then uh, so for relocating challenges, of course, again, relocating is not an easy as uh, as you mentioned. There are the key one, the first key to do that relocation is the acceptance of slum dwellers or the dwellers. That may, may take years, and it's not one way. Uh, uh, what do you call progress? Yeah, you can go back and forth and back and forth. It can be very dynamic. Uh, for example, the one in Surakarta actually it be, it's been done by three. Three three mayors. So it started from three mayors ago. Something 
So it's been the program has been taken by three mayors. So uh, starting from Pak Jokowi and then uh, the next uh, uh, the next mayor and now the, the newest one. And it's mayor uh, serve two periods. So 10, 10 years to 25 years. <laughs> so it is, it, I mean, step by step, not just one area that I mentioned, but several area also, not just the, the one that I show you. So 25 years to really have a good, uh, good and big uh, project uh, for slum upgrading or slum regeneration, uh, urban regeneration. So that's biggest challenge. I think the acceptance of the uh, 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 slum dwellers, and the issue can vary, can vary from cultural, from uh, groups, different groups in within the slum dwellers that may have contradictory opinion about this program. And they may influence one another, uh, and so on. So, so, so many. Uh, I think uh, another challenge is, of course, uh, how to we can finance this because it is not a, 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 a cheap program. Building housing is not cheap, yeah? especially with with so many dollars, uh, 500, 300, and so on. So it's a, how we finance. That's why in the uh, in the next, I mean, more uh, massive uh, slum upgrading or urban regeneration, we're trying to also involve the uh, uh, private sectors. We develop together with the private sectors, but we also provide not just for the high income uh, group of people, but also for the low income group of people. Then they have their uh, rights to live there. So we're trying to do that, uh, but uh, we're trying also uh, the, the one that has, I mean, the slum dwellers has the right to, to, to the land. So that will be their shareholder or sell, what do you call it? They, they will be the shareholder of this 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 area together with the, uh, and the, the, the private sector will have the capital to build uh, the area. Because they, then, uh, but we also we need to make sure that it is will be uh, done in a, a equitable, um, just uh, balance uh, rights and kewajiban uh, uh, apa uh, balance balance uh, balance win win solution something like that. So uh, I think the biggest challenge for like what thing is like, uh, like uh, that, uh, the acceptance of the community and how we can finance this because then uh, local government also cannot really do it by themselves. We need to collaborate and uh, with with smaller uh, scale we can collaborate within the government budget, uh, uh, but not just local government but also with the central and provincial government. But for the bigger area, I think we need to uh, cooperate or collaborate with the private sectors. Maybe that's. Ajay, so far, so, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for Jyanti. If I could ask you a related question, uh, you know, what I get from your uh, uh, discussion that the focus, when we, when we talk about slum upgrading in Indonesia, the focus is on providing land, housing, and services to the slum dwellers. Uh, well, if we look globally, these massive housing programs for slum dwellers have had their pitfalls. Uh, Faisal can uh, talk about the million housing program in South Africa, Sri Lanka, we had a similar million houses program. India is fighting its own devils uh, under the prime minister housing program where built up housing is proposed to be provided to the urban poor at large. Uh, is there any thought on leaving housing, which is a private good to the households and focusing just on delivery of services in the slum settlements, more on the model which was explained by Faisal for Durban, that the city is just providing services in the slum settlements and leaving home improvement to the settlers, settler families there. Yeah. Uh, if looking at Indonesian case, I think we cannot just just providing services and then leaving the housing by uh, the floor by themselves. I mean, that's what we do. Uh, that's what we do in the past. And I, I think it's still uh, uh, now, and we want to change. I mean, we also need to give some uh, stimulant or uh, facilities to the 
uh, low income housing, uh, low income household uh, for the for the housing for building the house house as well. Uh, 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 the pitfall, I mean, uh, it may have uh, negative impacts, but uh, now the negative impact is bigger. I mean, uh, slum area is, we cannot prevent, with, we don't provide uh, affordable housing because we have a limited, su the supply for affordable housing is very limited in Indonesia, especially in the urban area, only five to 10% is provided. So we have a bigger number uh, of uh, people with uh, uh, an, uh, an inadequate housing. And they then uh, mostly uh, access the slum areas or informal settlements, even illegal, illegal piece of land, and they stay there with uh, very inadequate housing. It happens a lot in, in here. So I think we still need to provide supply of uh, public housing, which is uh, affordable but safe and decent as well. Uh, but of course, we need to have a, a good mechanism how we targeted this uh, person, even if it is rented or if it is uh, owned. Uh, and if it is uh, rented, I think we, we, we need to make sure that the, the mechanism is real. There is no, what do you call it, uh, uh, mistargeted because it was, happens before in Jakarta, especially public housing was then uh, 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 rented by not the, the beneficiary that we want, uh, not the low income housing, but uh, several middle middle to up in, uh, middle, especially the middle income households, uh, or uh, sometimes the rent uh, the rent is not enough to uh, op, uh, to maintain the the building itself, so it is deteriorated by the time uh, and the quality is getting. Uh, degraded and degraded. Uh, so again, we need to make sure that the there is a, a good uh, management as as well as how we finance this uh, sustainably. Uh, and the rent is need to be what do you call it? Calculate uh, 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 so, uh, properly uh, whether it's for uh, very low income housing that it may be need subsidy of course then we need to make sure that we have the subsidy or we can uh, like i said mix uh, we, we provide we, we build the area but it's a mix between the high middle and low so we can uh, have a cross subsidy for example for the area so people is this inclusivity everybody can live there but uh, it, uh, it is a, a good mechanism but for for own housing, but low income housing, we also, although we still have limited experience on this, I mean we haven't implemented. But uh, uh, the the public uh, we call it a low cost uh, apartment uh, own, yeah, it can be owned. But if they want to sell, they they cannot sell it within maybe five to ten or for quite some time for quite a long time. If they want to sell, of course, it has to go back to the. The, the agency or the, the management. So it will go back to the public housing supply again. Uh, that's, we're trying to do that so it will not be, uh, have a negative impact back to the, the situation. Uh, we have a, a new uh, agency in, in at the national level. Uh, we call it Badan Percepatan Pembangunan Rumah. So it's a, a housing, like a housing, housing, uh, development agency uh, we, it's just started this year so hopefully they will uh, have the role on of, of managing this kind of uh, public housing and make sure that there will be no uh, unexpected impacts like uh, maybe in some other countries thank you thank you thank you Vajayanti. uh now uh Faisal, uh you may like to come in and explain to us what were the policy breakthroughs in durban or in south africa uh, which helped you help the city to de-link service delivery from land tenure. And also you may like to respond to the question on community engagement for housing design and uh, provision of services. Over to you, Faisal. Thank you, uh, Ajay. Uh, I'll deal with those two questions. And I think there's been two others in the, in the chat, if you don't mind me dealing with those. Please, uh, please go in ahead. The in the Q and A, yeah, yeah. Just, just to uh, um, maybe a bit of correction uh, earlier, Jay. The 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 housing conventional housing or BNG program hasn't been replaced by the incremental. It it's still continuous, but at a very slow pace. Uh, 
while the incremental program is, an, is a parallel program, but we want as a city, or we're proposing that it becomes a primary program, um, uh, provision of, inf uh, of services. So on the, the land tenure issue, um, in terms of, uh, there hasn't been a national or provincial uh, policy directive that really assisted us, to be honest with you. It was the city itself that uh, sought legal opinion in terms of how it would deal, for instance, with, uh, with private, private land um, and, and, and what was required by the city to ensure that it had um, a strong case if it was challenged by, by private landowners in terms of provision of services. And, and you know, to touch wood, we, we so far, I would say 99% of our, our projects have gone through without any hitch. And where there have been um, resistance by, by, by private landowners, uh, either we, we, we discussed, uh, discussed the implica implications of such, uh, where, where uh, it was uh, necessary, there were rates, rebates, uh, property rates, rebates provided to the, the, the landowner. Um, but the bottom line is, if the city integrates that settlement into its plans, if it can, uh, uh, you know, outline to the landowner that it has some logical plan to deal with the settlement, it's in, uh, then I think it, it goes a, a long way in terms of satisfying some of the, the, the legal requirements. Um, so constitutionally, we, we, we couldn't say no to providing services to a, a settlement. Um, on the issue of uh, your community participation and community engagement, uh, once again, the conventional uh, housing program does make uh, provision for the setting up of or establishment of project steering committees uh, with the stakeholders, for the signing of social compact agreements, for meetings with communities, etc. So all that's in place. And, and the thing is, the, the, the subsidy calls for a minimum housing product. So by and large, uh, the, 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 the project manager is, is, is um, how can I say, he is confined in terms of providing a certain specification uh, within a sp certain budget and developers uh, are there to, to, to uh, what you call is develop as per the spec. So there's, to, and to be honest, there's very little scope for, for major changes in the design itself. Uh, and that's also maybe uh, one of the criticism on our part is, is chasing of, of targets. So, you know, in a particular financial year, you have to produce uh, so many uh, units. And so project managers are held accountable for, you have to deliver X number of units, otherwise you don't get your, you know, uh, you don't meet your, your targets and, you know, you, the implications of that. So very much, uh, you know, uh, target driven. However, in the new approach uh, to uh, incremental upgrading, we're looking at much greater community, uh, you know, engagement in, in, in the way the house is designed, uh, in the choice of even uh, simple things like um, the orientation of the house, you know, uh, 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 within the site. Um, having said that, there is as part of the conventional housing program, uh, a, a, a subsidy called the people's, a PHP, people's housing process, where people are provided with the, provided with the service site by government, but they can, Build their own house with funding provided. So, so there is that 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 uh, uh, what option uh, for people to get involved. There's also, uh, as part of the new approach, the reblocking of of settlements where communities get uh, worked uh, in partnership with with city officials in terms of making uh, uh, you know uh, making um, available pathways within the settlement where where uh, structures are identified and they're relocated by the community. Uh, uh, over time. Uh, Ajay, moving on to, I think, the two questions that came in the Q&A, and I'll try and deal with them very quickly. Uh, one is, the, what, is there any resistance in integrating the informal settlement into the formal city planning? I would say dealing with officials uh, and our counterparts, there hasn't been, uh, I, would, I would say, uh, resistance. I would say maybe uh, confusion, over, over the lack of how, how, how they should be taken forward. So I don't think that the, the willingness is there. It's, I think the administrative uh, issues that have to be dealt with. Of course, having said that, we haven't actually gone out for public comment 
on, on how these are integrated. So when the special development framework plans are, are, uh, are put out for public comment and where informal settlements are, uh, make up a, a significant uh, or, or make significant uh, what you call this impact on that, uh, it'd be interesting to see how, for instance, private landowners react uh, to that. Um, so something that, that, that we would have to go through um, uh, in the process. Uh, the other question dealt with in the informal settlement database and how do you plan to, to use it? So we've been dealing uh, largely with the capturing of um, you know, uh, attribute data, like for example, the location of the settlement, its boundaries, uh, in the GPS coordinates, uh, how many uh, households are residing, who is the ward councillor, what services are available. And that information assists us when we're dealing with, with, with our sister departments in terms of uh, you know, talking about the same settlement. In many cases, you know, the, you know, settlements are referred to by different names. We've got 587 uh, and sometimes one department is talking about a settlement. In the meantime, it's called a different name under our database. So trying to standardize settlement names, for instance, makes it easier to plan around it, uh, knowing what services are, are lacking or what's been provided already uh, gives you an indication of, of the deficits and, and where you can channel funding in terms of providing uh, those uh, missing services. And to take it one step forward or one step further is, is trying to integrate uh, data from, from communities if, if it's available or from NGOs or from, from uh, you know, academia. Uh, you know, things like socioeconomic information that can uh, assist us in, in even assisting uh, the, the communities at, at a different level uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomic facilities that may be lacking in a particular area. So it's an integration of data. It's being able to generate reports for, for, for the, the national government that's providing us with grants to say how we have channeled uh, grant funding towards uh, uh, you know, projects in informal settlements, uh, amongst other, um, what you call this, um, benefits. Um, yeah, I think I've answered the two, unless there are any others, uh, Ajay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Faisal. For sure, you have answered all the questions and uh, provided key information on uh, tenure as well. And it's very heartening to note that Durban uh, did not wait for policy advisory from the national government uh, and uh, took a legal opinion to delink service provision from uh, land tenure. And also the fact that, uh, you know, the Durban City Council is uh, data mining from various sources to develop a very comprehensive database. And uh, the whole issue is can all stakeholders have confidence in the data which is being developed by other stakeholders? Uh, generally, the cities tend to uh, state that the data from non-governmental sources are unreliable, but I think this whole approach needs to be changed and there need to be concerted efforts to develop uh, the city level database to be used for planning. Thanks, uh, Faisal, uh, once again. Let me now move to Renu Khosla. Hi, Renu. Hi. Uh, my, my question to you is pretty straightforward. Uh, I was talking about the need for built and open community spaces to install the surge infrastructure. Uh, from your experience, uh, your long-standing experience of working with slum communities, uh, do you think such built and open spaces are available in slum settlements? Uh, and is it possible to adopt the land pooling approach uh, to create open spaces uh, for, uh, for providing surge infrastructure, which is very, very critical at the time of managing or responding to disasters. And my third, the third part of my question is, would it help uh, if the slum communities were able to establish, would it help the slum communities to establish a partnership with the service providers for disaster relief if they were to identify and map the built and open spaces available for surge infrastructure in their uh, settlements. I hope my question is clear, Renu. 
Yes, Sajay, very clear. Simple questions are never that simple. Um, uh, so uh, let me um, start by answering um, your question around, um, you know, is there, is there space inside the community? Yes, there is space inside the community. Uh, what we need is to change the way we deliver services into the community. Uh, the services that we deliver in the community are engineered uh, to specifications that are you know, required at large scale, mega scale. Uh, what communities are, uh, slum communities are, they are organic in nature. Uh, they're very, um, you know, uh, it's impossible to deliver the standard engineered uh, system inside a slum. So what we really need to do are two things. We need to simplify the way we design. We need to simplify the design and the norms. And I think that is something which would help uh, provide solutions that are so much more local so much more owned and create, uh, you know, this idea of placemaking. So what I'm uh, saying is that, you know, what what land are we are we are we asking the poor to give up, uh, you know, uh, one by one square foot in a six by six square foot uh, house that the person is living? I think. I think it is it is uh, it is presumptions of uh, presumptions of us to assume that the poor will be happy to squeeze themselves further. So really, what you're saying is that inside the house you can squeeze yourself up because we want to create the surge infrastructure space, right? We want to create a pool land pooling system. So I believe that this is um, a very um, you know it. Um, uh, it's a very paternalistic or a very um, you know presumptuous approach uh, to way we are working with slum communities, and I think that the reason why um, this happens is because we don't have conversations with people. Now, participation uh, can it it actually there is a whole spectrum. Uh, around which participation happens. And we all know that it moves from tokenism uh, to uh, real and true participation. And I think we, we are still at the very bottom of our participation, um, uh, participatory ladder. Um, and uh, we, we need to fix the way participation happens. We've romanticized it. And uh, we know it requires time, we know it requires nurturing. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is the only way where, uh, by which we will be able to curate an ecosystem. Unless we talk to the people, we would not know how to fix the various uh, elements and bring them all together for, to, to disentangle poor and to, design, uh, to disentangle poverty, let me put it like that, poor from their poverty. Uh, so, so let's take an example of what uh, Tridevi had mentioned about, um, about the financial aspects of it. I think uh, Durban mentioned it. We've had the examples of, uh, uh, I didn't hear so much in uh, the Indian presentations, but, but finance is a very critical aspect of, financing is a critical aspect of uh, upgrading or housing, uh, and uh, uh, and we we have conventional microfinance systems that deliver financing to the poor, but that's not the way poor want financing. Poor want financing in more flexible, easy to pay back ways, uh, quick to be provided uh, through the probably the formal banking system. So what? we need to do is to informalize our formal banking system to be able to do that. So it's the enabling environment that we need to create for some of this, uh, some of this um, you know, redevelopment uh, uh, which we are talking about. But let me, you know, Ajay, what's been, I, as I was hearing all the presentations, you know, then I heard uh, Mr. Mathiwatnan and I heard Punjab and I kept 
feeling that you know okay maybe i'm wrong maybe maybe slum upgrading is scalable maybe green shoots are beginning to show up we have trailblazers we we've also got a replication which proves that yes something like this can be re replicated but i i don't know i still get this uncomfortable feeling that our narrative has shifted from upgrading to housing and as you mentioned yourself you know if we take housing out of this equation slum upgrading is doable slum upgrading does not require land tenure it just requires integration so we we just need to plug the poor settlements into the city systems and majority of our uh, slum settlements actually lie on infrastructure sanitation infrastructure corridors and it is so much uh, cheaper to you know just grid them on uh, to connect them and to be able to provide them with a personal toilet experience to have uh, water into their homes. Let's not worry about tenure. I think once uh, wealth starts getting created and we found a simplified infrastructure that allows a toilet at home has actually nudged investment of over a hundred thousand rupees, uh, you know, uh, one lakh rupees uh, within six months. Uh, by slum dwellers in their own housing, irrespective of the fact that the land is not tenured. The land is not tenured. They still feel safe enough to be able to invest in their housing and people are, and the productivity improves. So we have to understand the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole circle, uh, the circle uh, and the whole ecosystem within which this happens. Let me, before I stop, I just want to also, you know, uh, pick one more, um, you know, issue that uh, um, that actually is you know getting very concerning, and this comes from the fact that it is the it is housing which is, seems to be you know dominating the conversation now. The narrative is being dominated. When we talk about big housing, and when we talk about land, we know that land in inner city areas is not available. We know that land is pricey. We know that we cannot get parcels of land that can be pulled together, except if we do it on the fringe. So what we are doing is essentially we are peripheralizing uh, development. Uh, socially, we are, we are, uh, we are shifting uh, poor people out to the edges. We are making it more expensive for them to live there, but at the same time, it's more expensive for cities to move their infrastructure, uh, you know, miles away, because after all, you would then need to extend your infrastructure to those green. Plus, plus we are concretizing all our sponges. So we are, we are damaging the ecology. So it is a question about, you know, what are our priorities? Is our priority pricey land which can be developed by the private sector so that the city can get money and then we have the money which with which we can develop housing for the poor but at what cost so i'm going to stop here thanks renu thanks for highlighting so many uh, you know related uh, uh, rather important issues related to slum upgrading i couldn't agree more with you on the microfinance for housing uh, world over, it has worked well, but in India, we are yet to come up with the most appropriate microfinance for housing instrument. Uh, because you know the problem is that uh, this is you know this is being offered by non-banking financial companies, and their cost of funds is so high that they offer very high rates of interest to the lenders as well, uh, to the borrowers as well which given the long-term required for home loan payment, given the high amount of loan becomes unviable for the borrower. So it's not really work, but there are enough, uh, you know, examples, particularly from Chile and Peru, where microfinance for housing has really worked very, very effectively. Uh, but, you know, when, when I said, what are the possibilities of creating open spaces or built spaces in the dense settlements for surge infrastructure. Uh, of course, I was assuming that it would be done through community participation, not in a forcible manner. And uh, you would agree that uh, plot alignment and land pooling is the bottom line for in-situ slum upgrading. 
so I was looking at the prospects of adopting a similar approach for creating facilities which are to be used by the community members themselves. And this is just not in response to the pandemic, but is also very, very useful in the perspective of climate change impacts and disasters. Uh, but thanks very much for your input, Sureno. Uh, let me now invite uh, Shamali Haldar. Shamali, I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, Shamali, when we talk about slum upgrading, uh, it can happen in a mission mode, like we had the National Slum Upgrading Program, uh, uh, implemented by the national governments and cities were encouraged to adopt a citywide slum upgrading approach. And we were being provided funds for that as well. Uh, similarly, we heard from Orissa and Punjab where slum upgrading program is being run by uh, run on a mission mode. Now, under this mission mode, urban local bodies are more like an extended implementation arm of the national government and the state government and they are being provided funds to implement programs or policies of the national and state government but this is not the ideal situation uh, not all states have statewide slum upgrading programs and the country no longer has the national slum upgrading program the realistic situation is that there is no municipal budget head called slum upgrading or resilience. The budget heads are for services which are required for slum upgrading. And the urban local bodies in India are not particularly famous for interdepartmental coordination. Faisal in his presentation had flagged the, the point that various departments of the municipality coordinated amongst themselves for an integrated slum upgrading approach. Now, my question to you, having said all this, my question to you is, how do we, how do we support cities to adopt a coordinated approach to slum upgrading so that, uh, uh, so as to achieve the larger city goals like slum free status or uh, becoming a resilient cities? And how do you support cities to adopt a phased approach to making all settlements in the city resilient to climate change and disaster? Uh, you know, it's a pretty abstract question, but uh, you know, I would like you to focus on the coordination aspects, which are so very integral to impactful slum upgrading investments. Uh, is my question clear, Shamali? Thank you for that, Ajay. I think uh, you, of course, uh, are asking a very important question. But I think uh, to take a step back, I've been listening to the discussion um, entirely from the beginning. And um, what comes across to me is that um, how similar um, those of us who are involved in this work across uh, think about these uh, issues. So when we think about housing, we're really thinking about uh, and thinking about tenure security, we're thinking about them, uh, not just in terms of, uh, you know, the de jure rights or the formal title, which is the sort of the ultimate or the aspirational goal, but also the thinking about all the services and all the incremental uh, bits and pieces that really make um, tenure security possible on the ground. And, um, you know, this is precisely, I think, where we started our thinking and we have the privilege as Zoomedia Network India of being in the pole position of looking at various stakeholders, looking at different kinds of stakeholders, uh, be that research, be that policy, be that, uh, you know, nonprofit partners, and to think about how do we best, uh, you know, how do we best make connections work? How do we best support, uh, you know, uh, programs that have collaboration, coordination, these aspects kind of built into it. And, and in, in that process, you know, we've always thought about the de facto security of informal settlements, um, which ties into our urban governance work. And we've really always thought about it in multiple layers. So, you know, be that the political support, the political and administrative support required to make this happen, or be that, um, you know, the part around uh, amenities and service provisioning uh, that needs to happen or be that actually the grassroots capacity of uh, slum dwellers themselves that need to be developed in concert with um, you know, more resilient local um, institutions 
or be that on the other end, the data and technical capacity needed to capture the reality on the ground. So all these different things kind of add up in a way. In the case of Orissa, we have almost a perfect, uh, in some ways, almost a perfect model of how all these uh, parameters have come together. In other parts, different ones have played out to an extent. Um, what I think, uh, you know, there are, there are three things I think which we have learned, which might be a little bit different from what we've been talking about so far. Uh, so I thought I'll focus on that. Um, one is, uh, and all of this requires uh, a lot of coordination and collaboration between different stakeholders. Um, so one is making uh, data more accessible. So when we think about it, um, both at an addressing level, which makes uh, which makes simple locational data available and accessible, as well as mapping, right? Uh, there are different models that can be done. There's the top-down one where, which is led by the government. Drone maps, of course, is 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 a one-off exercise that will do it. But to keep something updated, to keep the data um, close to the reality on the ground, to the dynamic nature of reality on the ground, becomes a very important part of it. So, data and innovation. How do we think about um, data that can happen well. So um, we've seen certain nonprofits think of innovative approaches to this. For instance, uh, a nonprofit in Mumbai, Abnalia, has come up with this um, model of um, um, basically um, a public dashboard. So having people audit themselves and uh, put out their data. And that I think has been done in certain cities like Nairobi as well before. And I think it's been done um, at a large scale for the first time in India too. Um, similarly, addressing, how do you use existing addressing services like Google um, Maps to really make um, informal settlements more visible? Um, again, we've also looked at it from the perspective of research, where we've tried to support some innovative work and in how do we uh, think about these two think about these questions with the future um, in mind. So not just about how do we capture the reality right now, but how do we simulate the changes that will happen in the future? So for instance, uh, one of the studies we did in association with Duke University um, that studied the urban form of Bangalore city and found that the number of slums on the ground and the number of slums that they could capture out of machine learning models was almost three times that of the number of slums on the ground. Um, and this was validated by on-ground surveys as well. So it was a very useful tool and, and other cities can you know, actually use the tool. It's available on GitHub and these are all public resources that are uh, you know, um, are present. Similarly, just recently, we've uh, actually funded another project which looks at a computational model for housing. So what is affordable and what is housing and what are the different scenarios that go into it? So which combines the individual household to the policies uh, that are available at a local level, as well as looks at longitudinal data on finance and other sort of, uh, you know, ecosystem factors that go into making a household affordable. And how does how can that how can different uh, household parameters change what a policymaker does, uh, and what are these different scenarios, and how can that happen? So this is done by a group called Fields of View, which looks at computational models, for instance. So I really think we've uh, you know sort of looked at data, we've looked at innovation, and we've sort of thought about it with a wrapper of incrementality. That you know increment increment incremental approaches have the most merit. And all approaches need to be built on each other. And um, so, which is why I'm building on what everybody else has said, and I'm not repeating what has already been said, but these are some of the new things I thought I would bring to the table uh, in terms of what we've done. Uh, but otherwise, I think the rest has already been kind of very, very beautifully outlined by Renu and by um, others as well who've spoken before. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, over to you, Ajay. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Shamali. Uh, for sure, I agree with you that uh, uh, it's the data which helps to connect the dot. It's the data which helps to coordinate as, as well. And it's the data which helps to establish effective partnerships uh, within uh, across departments in the same organization, across organizations, and across stakeholders as well. Thanks for this, uh, Shamali. Uh, last but not the least, let me invite uh, Shubhagato. Uh, Shubhagato, you have the opportunity of, of having the last word really in this panel discussion. Uh, you know, I think one of the panelists mentioned that uh, it is presumptuous for us to believe that what is envisioned at the national or the state level under policies and programs gets translated effectively uh, at the city scale, at the ground level. Uh, 
you know it's not necessary that the 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 objectives of the policies and programs are achieved through ulb action the city action my question to you is what do you think are or which are the key facilitating support activities at the city level to help translate the state government policies into city programs for impacts on ground in terms of enhanced uh, city resilience shubhagato am i clear yeah yeah thanks ajay uh, means uh, uh, thanks uh, i i'm sure there is no last word on this and it will be with us for some time uh, so uh, so that's uh, uh, having passed that barrier i think uh means uh, it, it was delightful to be part of this uh, uh, uh you know event today because it brought to us a range of issues faced at the national level at provincial levels and then at the city level right and it kind of brought together large countries with uh, federal systems which are uh, with different federal systems and different political economies surrounding slum upgrading uh so uh i mean uh, to to uh, to try and achieve a last word or to be a technical specialist in something like this i think is a uh, is anyway a fallacy so uh, you have to work through the governance system and the planning systems which are long historical processes uh they are uh, and slum upgrading uh, has been a window that that uh, western countries let's say from the uh, uh, let's say 1900 to uh, 1940s or 50s um, after the war uh, solved the, much of their problems in in context in asia and in uh, africa where cities are growing very rapidly uh, at this stage uh, it, the, the range of instruments that you need uh, the the availability of new data policies uh the the challenges that you face on resilience itself uh a, a, for example are all new and so this is a continuously regenerating learning process uh while uh, means there is no doubt for example like uh, uh what fazel presented as his last slide as our universal principles about slum upgrading uh and will apply uh, to all contexts uh there are the understanding how this will be translated through the uh, through the political economy of that that rules over that uh, certain space is invaluable uh so uh, so in in if one was to look at the examples in, uh, from india uh, uh within this context there uh been slum upgrading uh has been done for example in, in so so punjab's model uh, relies on land tenure as the starting point and so did orissa a couple of years back uh, unlike many slum upgrading programs especially those done by international agencies right uh, the, the the political economy that drove uh, the resolution of land to become important It, it, there is a lot of uh, uh, you, you know there's lots to understand what what, what uh, circumstances uh, lead to that kind of a push above slum upgrading for example and then slum upgrading comes in second in, in orissa as you see and punjab uh, punjab has a lesser problem of that because their slums are quite well served already yeah uh, through past programs uh, there there are gaps to be filled but uh, but uh, not Uh, not as high as in orissa uh, and so uh, uh, give, given this context as well as the provincial government taking the lead is is also a part of our federal system uh, in in our constitution lo, uh, state governments are still responsible for urban development and within uh, within our uh, local government structure only larger municipal corporations have uh yeah, adequate authority over land to do some real planning about it uh, uh even even in large cities there are parallel state institutions doing planning often who who uh, who often uh, don't interact adequately with uh, with the municipal corporation which is to deliver the services or even govern the land so to say uh, so uh, so within uh, within all of this 
uh, uh, legacy institutional frameworks, uh, 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 negotiating, uh, you know, equality of service provision, uh, justice, uh, environmental justice, and uh, and uh, going forward is is going to be played out differently. And some of these objectives have to be met within. You know, means they, some of them will translate into reforming the institutional structure, but not all will, nor can we actually wait for institutional ch structures to change before we uh, go out to deliver. So what's interesting in all of these cases is how different tiers of government have looked at their problems and solved it to, to the demand that they are facing. And both the Orissa, for example, the uh, the local bodies are still uh, learning so much. Yeah, uh, there, there is uh, lots of decentralization that yet can happen. But for example, the slum upgrading program gave them a lot of opportunity to decentralize. So you don't also decentralize in a vacuum. Yeah, you need a, a, a program alongside that for it for decentralization to happen. So just a simple example is that when the first phase of uh, Jaga mission was happening and uh, the surveys were happening and the drone images were happening, it could have been done in a much more centralized fashion. Yeah, uh, And that's also uh, a lot of what is happening in Punjab today, maybe. Uh, but uh, but as soon as you start doing slum grading, you can't do it from, uh, from sitting in the state capital. You have to do it from uh, ward to ward, city to city, et cetera. So how those programs are built uh, also allows for that de decentralization to happen. So these municipalities who have never built a, uh, you know, they have no assets of their own. They have no past experience of construction or even these new habitats is possibly the biggest project that they are implementing today uh, will be the biggest asset that they would have created. It's a, it has to be built incrementally. And unlike many, a few countries that have had these big bang decentralization exercises, uh, there's lots to learn that uh, there is even a uh, means that there is centralization beyond decentralization too. It's not an end game in itself. So, so uh, a more sustainable uh, approach, which has been India's uh, longstanding, uh, a, 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 you, you know, evolutionary process uh, has been, uh, is what we, what we have seen to be witnessing with slum upgrading. And I think that uh, means this focus on housing versus slum upgrading is also interesting that, uh, you know, means more national governments, more uh, governments with a more dislocated from a locality or servicing uh, the requirements on the ground, uh, face these challenges of keeping tra targets at the top of their mind more than uh, local bodies which are working with, with populations more directly. So, so this target setting approach uh, will remain in and mission uh, approaches will remain. Uh, but within that, we have, to, uh, we have to kind of find programs that will help take the decentralization agenda incrementally forward. I'll leave that there, Ajay. I hope I got to your question. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Shubhagato. You are absolutely, uh, you know, bang on the point. And uh, if I was to draw a key message from your talk, I would say uh, that the effectiveness, uh, there is the, you know, there is the need to strengthen the urban local bodies uh, by reforming the legal, institutional and policy framework within which the urban local bodies are embedded. And you will agree, uh, urban reforms relating to mandate, HR and finance are the key to the strengthening process. And for sure, the decentralization can happen in the pr perspective of the assigned mandate. Uh, so I leave it there. Thanks very much, everyone, to all the panelists for your insights. And with this, let me hand it to Yogita and Urban for the hard task of summing up and concluding. Thanks very much. Yeah, hi, thank you, Ajay. Uh, I know we've overshot time by 20 minutes at least right now, and I don't want to take too long, but I'll just be very brief in just recapping whatever we have gone through in the four presentations. 
So first we started with Mr. Mathivathnan, who spoke about the Jaga mission. Some key points that he spoke is that one, the mission does not uh, look at uh, just providing housing or land rights, but it's talking of empowering uh, the uh, slum dwellers. So uh, one is the universal access to basic services, which is uh, key to this whole thing. Uh, in situ provision and the second is creating a livable habitat. So what Ajay has been talking about of infusing uh, public amenities and uh, open spaces and uh, in addition to just providing uh, infrastructure, basic infrastructure is what the Jaga mission is looking at. Uh, also, what Mr. Mativadnan very importantly said is that it's not just slum upgrading or uh, slum rehabilitation that is going to be the need of the hour but uh, we also will need to slum proof the city. So we have to look at different strategies that uh, for uh, you know, increasing affordable land and housing in the city, for creating rental housing. So these are the kind of approaches, uh, which is a multi-pronged approach that our cities will have to look at. Uh, after that, we move to um, uh, the Punjab case. Uh, both these missions are state driven. Uh, they are, uh, so-called, you know, initiated by the chief ministers and they have uh, been moved uh, ahead. Uh, the uh, Punjab Basera mission takes off from the Jaga mission, take, gets inspired from the Jaga mission. It was launched in uh, 2020 during the pandemic year. Uh, very importantly, it has, a, it has been backed by legislative instruments. That is the first thing that they put uh, in place, an act that backs the whole thing, giving proprietary rights to slum dwellers. Um, uh, it's targeting around 0.3 million households in 167 slums across the state. 40% uh, of the slums being in just 2 million plus cities. So that is a big target uh, to achieve. Uh, they have just begun, but uh, what Mr. Ajay also spoke about very uh, importantly is that the base work, the groundwork, uh, the identification of beneficiaries, the, uh, you know, the more you work with technology to bring in transparency is something that will allow for a better, uh, uh, the focus on transparency being very important. Uh, we then move to Mr. Faisal, uh, who gave a very uh, detailed uh, outlay of what happens in Durban. Uh, the scheme has been going on since uh, 2010. The efforts towards uh, incremental informal settlement has been going on since 2010. Uh, some of the key things that he uh, pointed out from the experience of this in incremental informal settlements uh, approach is that uh, one is the categorization of slums at the start is very crucial to be able to, uh, you know, they don't have just one or two categories, but they have four or five categories that actually help them devise uh, very tailor-made approaches for slum upgrading in these uh, individual uh, categories. Then again, it's a multi-pronged approach. They're not only looking at upgrading, but they're also looking at improving their rentals and ownerships. Uh, there is an attempt to integrate this whole thing with spatial plans in the city. Uh, also, one key thing that he uh, pointed out was that the coordination with various departments from the start uh, has given an opportunity for bringing in innovations for developing sustainable solutions which like how uh, Renu Kosla also pointed out that, you know, you need to have very local sustainable solutions rather than larger uh, citywide solutions. Um, then he also spoke the, about the importance of regulatory approaches, uh, legislative frameworks that uh, can secure this because you're not providing ownership or you're not providing tenure of rights in the upgrading thing. That also brings about the need to secure uh, whatever investments are being made. Um, he spoke about the importance of partnerships and uh, very importantly, softer interventions that are important to uh, be able to have sustainable communities. Uh, moving on to Indonesia, Mr. Ms. Virjayanti uh, uh, spoke of uh, the problems that most of the cities have, but particularly very uh, strong in Indonesia is the problem of urbanization with 90% of the urban population focused only in one island, 20% um, uh, in slums. But in addition to slums, she also pointed out that there are 40% of people living in inadequate housing. That is also something that needs to be 
provided for uh, one key thing that they have they also have various programs at the national level which uh, talk about housing finance subsidies for low income but which unfortunately do not uh, you know reach the informal settlements then you have the new housing which includes public housing you have uh, housing improvement programs which are also uh, because there are almost 80% self developed houses and not in a very good condition that is that becomes very crucial for uh, indonesia to target and uh, also the integrated slum upgrading program because the slums are really rampant almost covering around 100 100000 hectares uh, in indonesia so i'll just end at that and i'll just pass it on to <coughs> arun who will then talk about you know sum up uh, summarize the panel discussion yeah thank you thank you yogita and i uh, apologize because i somehow cannot uh, turn on my camera right now so initially it was working but right now it's not so i'll just get on with it so i think uh, for, if we want to summarize uh, all the discussions and the presentations i think one thing is clear and that is that there is a need to adopt a city wide approach yeah. uh, now one of the major issues that we uh, all face when it comes to slum upgrading is the uh, issue of tenure security now when uh, the example of indonesia was being given uh, it was said that uh, you know indonesia has this high occurrences of uh, land ho holding or skewed ownership where a few people own you know the large chunks of land so there are uh, several ways in which the, uh, this kind of a situation can be addressed like one of them is uh, the identification of government owned lands where under utilized land can be used for developing housing and uh, giving uh, the people the right to stay and not the right to ownership perhaps uh, there is also the possibility of uh, public housing on government owned land uh, through mous uh, another aspect is the culture is the overcoming of the cultural barrier in order to increase the acceptance of communities living amongst themselves uh, another crucial factor is definitely the financial factor because uh, whenever construction of housing and infrastructure is involved uh, finance is a major factor uh, from south africa we got to learn that you know uh, although there are uh, no national level policies on land tenure uh, but the city level uh, 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 actions have been taken and uh, you know for uh, the example of durban is very interesting where uh, the durban authorities they are mining data from various Uh, sources not just government but also ngos and other institutions and this point i think was also highlighted by shalmoli which uh, who you know if, if could be summarized it could be said that uh, data help establish partnerships between uh, various departments and another uh, very important aspect of slum upgrading is the uh, you know the necessity to develop uh, resilient communities in order to minimize the impacts of natural or man made disasters and for that there is requirement for uh, you know public open community spaces uh, for setting up such infrastructure in order to tackle uh, climate change impacts and uh, natural disasters uh, another uh, key point that was discussed is that the micro finance uh, Uh, sector in india is not is still evolving and and mostly these finances are provided by these non banking finance companies who charge a uh, high rate of interest which uh, acts as a deterrent for uh, you know individuals to approach them and uh, uh, get financial loans and the and, uh, and last but not the least it is very important to uh, Uh, strengthen the ULBs because only in that way, uh, you know, there could be a decentralization uh, process. And there, this, uh, you know, without decentralization, uh, you know, any kind of uh, implementation activities on ground level is very difficult. And uh, right now, uh, you know, the situation in India uh, requires some uh, quite a deal of work. Uh, yeah. Thank you, and then and over to Anna. 
thank you, Arpan. Uh, well, I, I think uh, we came to the end, right, Ajay? Shubagato and Injita, uh, it was a wonderful discussion. I think we went through several cases. Unfortunately, we learned that is, we confirmed that less, we have less than more, but we have uh, a yeah, lot of learning, more learning. And I believe uh, a solid ground, right, to move forward. I, I feel that slowly, slowly we are coming to to major consensuses, right? I love the idea that Shubagato proposed of having universal principles that could land differently in different places. Uh, in, I shared here on the chat that in Latin America with some partners, we developed the uh, kind of decalogue for comprehensive sum upgrading where we agreed on, on some basic principles based on 40, almost 50 years experience of sum upgrading in the region. Uh, so yeah, maybe those principles can 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 be helpful in terms of guide, you know, uh, and improve um, national and, and local policies. But nevertheless, I'm glad that we are building this community of practice, and um, this can be also very helpful to speed up, uh, I believe, some processes um, in the future as we identify, you know, common solutions for yeah common uh, bottlenecks. So yeah, I think it's over for today and looking forward to see you um, in the third day. Uh, thank you, Anindita, please go ahead. <laughs> you can announce the right <laughs> date and time because- Yeah, yeah. looking yeah. forward to see you on 24th. That's Friday at 4.30 p.m. And we'll stick to our time. <laughs> so thank you so much. And please do join. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye.